Today, Sir Keir Starmer pledges to boost military spending to 2.5% as he claims the country's nuclear deterrent is safe in his hands. The Conservative Party, according to polling, is no longer trusted on defence. So can Labour step into its shoes? Find out more with me very soon. Controversial NFL star O.J. Simpson, who was cleared of murdering his ex-wife and her friend in a criminal trial, dies at the age of 76 following a battle with cancer. People in Portland are furious over what they deem to be a luxury-free bus service that ferries asylum seekers around. Men are up in arms over a women's social media page that calls out exes on their bad behaviour. We're asking, should people really name and shame their old flames? A news presenter, Rachel Burden, claims having a baby at 41 was really selfish. We'll debate that later in the programme. Good morning. England captain Harry Kane says his three children are fine after they were involved in a three-car crash in Germany earlier this week. We look back on a thrilling night of Europa League action and in golf we'll have updates from the Masters. Some warm sunshine across southern parts as we head into the weekend, but a wetter story further north. I'll have more in the full forecast shortly. Good morning to you. I'm Stephen Dixon. And I'm Ellie Costello and this is Breakfast on GB News. Well, I'm very pleased you're here this morning. Oh, thank you very much. Because at one point, I did think it could just be me. Yeah, I had one of those. Do you know when you... If you work shift work, which you may well do if you're watching at this hour, yeah. um, I always set my... I mean, I, always, I get into bed, set the alarm. Mm. I think I must have not... I don't think I slept through it. I think I've just, I must have just not set the alarm. Yeah. Last night and woke up an hour and a half after I should have got up. But... Still got In here. the most incredible scenes. So you incredible left, scenes. It was incredible scenes. You left your house in four and a half minutes. Four, yes. You made Can your you way down here and four you. And a half she, he looks amazing. And you were here with like 15 minutes to spare, like it was no big deal. And I, I could just hear him go, hello! <laughs> <laughs> I was Aww. like, oh, he's here, he's made it. Um, yeah, and I can tell you I didn't speed. Did you not? I was no. thinking you'll be flying down the M1. No, didn't speed, because recently, between the two of us, we've had a couple of tickets. Oh, have you? Mm. Naughty. So that's a couple of uh, a couple of, of those nice courses to go on, one each. Oh, I quite enjoy those, you know. <laughs> Is it in person or Zoom? No, we're doing it on Zoom. Well, oh, uh, uh, yeah, well, I haven't organised mine yet. But it's one of those things I didn't even know I'd been... Dawn, it was one of them. Oh, it's so annoying. So, of course, now it's like, right, OK. Got to behave yourself. Stick to the speed Well, limit. I think it's very good. I would have been in the right flap, but he was very relaxed, very calm. And you well, look what great. What can you do? What can you do? But it's it's a horrible... You know it's a horrible feeling. But um, I, I was here by myself, right, and I was in charge of the autocue, yeah. thinking I was going to have to ride solo. I felt like the teenager in charge of the family car. <laughs> I felt really <laughs> under it's pressure. Terrible. I was a bit scared, so I'm glad you're here. Just get off that. And you're in charge. Very important. I can t I've come bearing good news, oh, though. Oh, yeah, tell me. That April is set to be... A record high for temperatures. A scorcher. According to the Daily Star this morning... Well, we could do with that. We could hit 20 degrees tomorrow. Stunning. Which is not bad. So that would make it the hottest ever April in the UK. And it's lovely that the Daily Star has, has marked that by picturing a young lady in a bikini eating an ice cream. Wow. Taking up most of the I page. I expect nothing less. It's like a <laughs> tiny little bit in the corner <laughs> saying it's going to be hot this month. Yeah. Um, yes. But there you go. So it's going to be lovely. I'm desperate for a bit of nice weather. I know. Me too. I feel like it lifts all of our moods. Yeah. It, oh, it does, doesn't it? So what, what needs to happen tomorrow after we do the show... Oh. ..you can't nap because you can't waste the opportunity. You have to head out to your garden, cos Stephen's got a garden. And just lounge. Lounge in the garden. You can, I, you can maybe snooze in the in the garden if you like. Okay. But no nap tomorrow. Don't waste the day. Okay. Right. Fair enough. Because apparently I heard from oh. Claire Pearson and Nigel Nelson outside it was very hot yesterday, but I missed the whole thing because I was asleep. Oh, was it? No, I missed it yesterday. Yeah, this is what I mean. If you're on shift work, you miss the day. I'm going to be tired today. I've got to go for a haircut. After oh. It's a tough it's, life. Because I'm looking. It's a bit bedraggled. You don't look bedraggled. He could never look bedraggled. He's so the most smart-looking man ever. It's, 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 oh I don't God. like compliments. He's had enough. Um, <laughs> I don't like compliments. Anyway, look, yes. but, well, unless they're coming from you, of course. Oh. Um, and we'd love to know what you think about the show, what we're doing, what you want to talk about. 
what issues are, are grabbing your attention this morning. And you know GP Views at gpnews.com was the, the famous email address, but no more. Mm -mm. It's gone, hasn't it? Yes, instead it's gpnews.com slash you'll say. Here's how you can get in touch. We are proud to be GB News, the people's channel. And as you know, we always love to hear your views. Now, there's a new way of getting in touch with us at gbnews.com forward slash your say. By commenting, you can be part of a live conversation and join our GB News community. You can even talk to me, Bev Turner, or any of the members of the GB News family. Simply go to gbnews.com forward slash your say. Uh, so that's how you get in touch. Love to hear from you this morning. As soon as I get organised, I will log in to see what you're saying. Uh, but our main news this morning, and the Labour leader, Sir Keir Starmer, says the UK's nuclear deterrent is the bedrock of his plan to keep Britain safe. Well, this is in stark contrast to the Jeremy Corbyn era, who was a champion of nuclear disarmament. Well, meanwhile, Sir Keir said he would like to boost the defence budget to 2.5% of GDP. Well, we're now joined by our political correspondent, Olivia Utley, who joins us live now from Westminster. Good to see you this morning, Olivia. And this is in stark contrast, isn't it, to the Corbyn era? Well, absolutely. I mean, Keir Starmer is always on a mission to distance himself from Jeremy Corbyn. And in pledging this, this sort of impassioned uh, defence of defence, he is doing just that. He's promised a triple lock for uh, defence. He says that, uh, the Labour Party will build four new nuclear submarines at Barrow and Furness. Uh, he says it will upgrade the Trident nuclear defence system in any way that it needs upgrading and that the Labour Party will keep that continuous submarine protection at sea. I mean, this was this was very, very strong stuff. And it will be the first time in 30 years that a Labour Party will bi visit that Barrow and Furness site. So this is a, a really, really strong commitment. He says also that Labour will uh, put 2.5% of GDP towards defence. Now, the Conservative Party at the moment is only pledging 2.3%. Uh, lots of defence secretaries uh, subsequently have, have asked the Chancellor to raise that to 3%, but Jeremy Hunt has ignored those calls in recent budgets. Well, now Labour is essentially just stealing the Conservatives' clothes. Uh, Keir Starmer has said that eventually, by 2030, he would like to see defence spending raised to 3% of GDP, and he would like it at 2.5% in the near future, although there is a little bit of a caveat to that. He says he can only raise it to 2.5% if it is within Labour's own borrowing rules. This is very strong stuff from the Labour leader, and already the general public sounds as though it is trusting Labour more than the Conservatives on defence. In a poll for the Mail last month, only 24% of the country trust Conservatives on defence, whereas 34% of the country trust Labour on defence. That is a huge shift, and another sign that Keir Starmer is edging towards that centre ground territory, sweeping up some of those Tory heartland votes. It's going to be interesting to see what um, backbenchers and grassroots Labour members think of all of this, though, isn't it? it? Just because of the whole momentum movement, which we haven't heard a lot about recently, but obviously very behind the, the sort of Corbyn ethos, if you like, um, sort of uh, up against people like John Woodcock, now Lord Walney, who, of course, was MP for Barrow and Furness, uh, Labour and Co-op MP for Barrow and Furness, who I mean, effectively had this massive falling out with Jeremy Corbyn over the whole nuclear issue. Well, exactly, and I think that'll be a really interesting development to watch over the next few months. Since Keir Starmer took office, he has completely changed the face of the of the Parliamentary Labour Party. His shadow cabinet is stuffed with Blairites and their successors, and some of the most uh, vociferous Corbyn supporters, including, of course, Jeremy Corbyn himself, have actually been stripped of the whip. But as you say, Stephen, in the party at large, the Labour Party outside of Parliament, members of the party, there are still a lot of Jeremy Corbyn supporters. The Labour Party membership tends to be quite a lot more left-wing than the Labour Party in Parliament. So how is that going to play out? Will we see a whole slew of members deserting the party? Even Keir Starmer can't afford that. In an election year, you need as many members as you can possibly get. Those are the people who are pounding the streets at the weekend, giving out leaflets, campaigning for their local candidates. 
if a bunch of them decide to leave the party because they think that uh, Keir Starmer is 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 too robust, if you like, in his defence of Trident, something which Jeremy Corbyn wanted to scrap altogether, then that could be trouble for the Labour Party. That said, there are lots of disgruntled Conservative voters who care very, very deeply about defence. Ben Wallace, the defence, the former Defence Secretary, who pledged to, who wanted to raise that defence spending to 3%, was incredibly popular in the Conservative Party. If the Labour Party could sweep up some of those Conservative members, perhaps, then that would be a very nice situation for Keir Starmer. Yeah, wouldn't it just? Um, OK, Olivia, thanks very much indeed. I'm, I'm particularly fascinated by this, just because I'm, Barrow is, is my hometown. Yeah, I thought um, of you the first thing I read this morning. Yes, I mean, I remember watching when I was at school or sixth form or something, watching the very first Trident come out and all my, you know, family, grandparents, uncles all worked in the shipyard in Vickers mm. and then um, whatever it became. What did, we, don't, what did it become? <laughs> Vickers, I can't remember. <laughs> they all just call it Vickers up north. Oh. Um, but it's, um, I, I just think it's, it's absolutely fascinating. It's going to be fascinating to see what happens in Barrow, actually, which is an area which is now becoming very deprived. Well, it's good actually. for investment in the local community, isn't it? It, it, would, it could have a huge impact for Barrow, mm. which, of course, obviously had a... was traditionally Tory, then mm. became Labour with John Hutton back in 92, I think, um, and then switched back to Tories at the last election. Mm. Now, what's that going to mean for their uh, parliamentary seat there. It's just, it's just makes, it just makes this whole election so interesting, so doesn't interesting. it? Because mm -hmm. everything just seems to be getting spun on its head a little bit. Mm. Probably because in the centre ground they're all quite similar. Yeah, and it's such a stark contrast to what we're hearing from Jeremy Corbyn, isn't it? I mean, I just find it absolutely fascinating. Yeah. So do let us know what you make of that. Also, what do you think it will mean for core Labour voters, so the CND types, the Stop the War Coalition types? I mean, what would they make of all of this? I think it's I really know. interesting. Do let us know what you think. I don't know if they, if they, if they, well, is that just what momentum became or what became, you know? Yeah. I don't know, but you don't hear much about momentum anymore, do you? No, you at don't. The, at the moment, at least. But as you say, it's, it will still be there on the back benches. It's, it's going to be there to an extent. Yeah. yeah. It's going to be interesting to hear. And we're talking to, I think we're talking to Luke Pollard later on, aren't we? We are, yes. Who's a Labour MP. Even the 8am. So we'll get all of the details on that. Do keep your views coming in. Now, at least 10 Conservative MPs will defect to Reform UK if Nigel Farage comes out of retirement to lead the party. Uh, that's what one of his biggest... Well, Farage's biggest former financial backers, Aaron Banks, has said on a podcast with our political editor, Christopher Hope. Let's hear what he has. We've seen one Tory MP defect. I expect to see others. Um, How many more? I think it could be a landslide because you, you're not going to be able to win as a Red Bull Tory um, up so north So how many the two MPs might defect? So this is where I think you get to an interesting point of view, don't you? Because as reformer approaching the Conservatives in the poll, fast, first past the poll dictates that whoever's in second place, you know, could mm. then potentially get a wave of support from the other party. Mm. Um but how the heck are you going to win as a Red Bull Tory? You can't. They, they've abandoned it. Their strategy now is to try and retain 150 seats in, in the home counties, which is why they're trying to be a little bit liberal. You know, liberal Democrats have, seem to have vanished into a... So how many do you think oh. Tory MPs might come across to reform well, UK pre-election? Well, this is the point. You can't win as a Conservative MP up north. Your brand is completely destroyed. I mean, some, some will. Where? I, mean, I don't know. And, I mean, when I say up north, I'm talking about, you know... Yeah, Midlands, maybe, northern England. But, is it, but, that, the po but, but, but frankly, the polls are suggesting that so are rebel about, it, Tory is going to be completely could dozens come time. across? I think more than dozens. Tory MPs I actually don't say that because, you know, the, they're at a point where they can't win as a Conservative, but they might have half a chance as a reform candidate. When you say that, you say that you think... Yeah. Or have you, do you know names that you can't say now or you can well, say Well, I know at least three or four names of... Who are in talks now? Yeah, that people are, are, are talking about that. And I would expect this just to accelerate. But it, it, this is the Farage factor, that if he comes back and then they pick up another two or three points in the polls. So Richard Tice has done a good job, but I, I think the when you see 15 points in the polls, that's really the hope factor that Nigel's coming back. Right. But actually, if he does come back and gets traction, 
and you start to see. I think there's there's some polls out already saying that they're ahead in with men in the Midlands. That's and right. North, if you break and it down, and break it down. They're already leading groups. in certain places, and I think the Tory party have given up on. They know they're going to lose, so they're trying to focus on, you know, re-emergence of one nation, soft Tory, the MP for Reigate, you know, it's that kind of mm. Tory MP. So um, to be quite clear, if, if Nigel Farage came to lead Reform UK... Oh, I think 10, I think 10 Tory MPs would walk across the, 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 the thing straight away. And I think as well, he, that, that's part of his calculus. You know, MPs are in contact with him daily about this kind of thing. And I think... You know, if he does come back, it will be on the back of something fairly spectacular. Well, let's talk to Labour commentator James Matthewson, who joins us now. James, lovely to see you this morning. What do you make of all of this? I mean, it's all it's all a bit um, bit of a wish list, isn't it, from Aaron Banks? Yeah, I think it's hopeful thinking, um, to put it mildly, from Aaron Banks. I do think there's some stock in what he has to say. Um, I wouldn't like to be a Tory MP uh, in the Red Wall, coming up to, you know, or, or supposedly the Blue Wall now, as it has been since 2019, um, coming up to this, you know, election, because there is going to be an absolute swathe of them who lose. However, this idea that all of a sudden they're all going to cross the floor and they're going to take a chance... Tory MPs uh, and, and Conservatives notoriously um, play it safe. You know, they, they will put their party before a lot of other things. And I don't think... I would be surprised to see 10 cross the floor just because of Nigel Farage, as appealing as I'm sure uh, Nigel Farage's leadership is to many Tory MPs. But if this is to be believed, it does suggest, doesn't it, that even Conservative MPs don't want the party to succeed at the next general election. Yeah, exactly, and that's that's a real concern for the Tories. I think what's happening now, though, uh, and Aaron Banks did get this bang on, is the fact that the Tories have accepted their fate. The Tory staffers who I speak to on a semi-regular basis have all conceded the fact they're going to lose. They've conceded the fact they're going to get absolutely slaughtered at the election, and the reality is they're just trying to, to make sure they can survive the day so that they can rebuild. The big question for me is, what does this mean for the Tories after that election? Because we're almost guaranteed to see a Labour government, and in that time, that space that's left in opposition for the Tories, are they going to lurch to the right, or are they going to go more down the One Nation route with somebody like, you know, Penny Mordaunt, or are they going to, you know, I mean, we've talked about a Nigel Farage leadership of the Tories in some scenarios. Are we going to see uh, reform and the Tories potentially brought closer together in opposition. Are we, are we losing the old trope that, you know, you win by attracting the centre ground? <coughs> oh, excuse me. Because certainly, I mean, here, and, and you look at the States as well, things seem to be becoming more polarised. Yeah, things are. And, and I think that's a concern for anybody who, who cares about, you know, doing things in a balanced and measured way, uh, because the extremes in my opinion, don't offer solutions. You know, they offer very simple answers to complex questions. And I think sometimes that can be very alluring to people. We look at the likes of Donald Trump in America. Um, you know, I mean, even even in my time in the Labour Party with Jeremy, you know, the offer that was there uh, that was unrealistic, but obviously attracted lots of people. People want those bold and and, and big gestures from politics a lot of the time, when actually, is it what we really want? Do we want somebody running the country who is extreme in their views? Or do we want someone who's, you know, measured, sensible, pretty boring, if, if we're being honest? We're talking about somebody like Keir Starmer, but is it a safe pair of hands? And hopefully that centre ground is where the majority of, of sensible decisions can be made for the future of the country. Oh, well, we shall see. James, good to see you. Thanks very much indeed. I mean, the one thing, it, was ad it is addressed in the podcast with Chopper. Have you listened? Uh, uh, to clips. Yeah. I've listened to clips. I think it only came out at six o'clock this morning, didn't it, in full? And but, to be fair, um, you, were, you were racing down here. And I was racing down the motorway. <laughs> yeah. um, but it's, the, it's Richard Tice in all of this, yeah. who is the Reform Party. And this is all about people saying, OK, Richard, thanks for holding the, the fort, fort. Mm. but now get out and we're going to put Farage and in. And Farage would be the game-changer. And I can't... I mean, Richard, he could well be watching because he does watch Breakfast on GB News. Um, I just wonder what he makes of that. Yeah. Would he be willing to do that? Is that the long-term game plan that we didn't know about? Yeah. Or 
is he actually absolutely blooming furious yeah. that this is being talked about? Richard Tice, feel free to come on the programme and let us know what you think. I don't think Nigel is going to lead reform. I think he's got a really good thing going on. Yeah. And I think he might join the Tories a little bit later on down the line. That's oh, my prediction. Just putting it out there. Yeah. Right. yeah. He's got a lot of support from the Tories. Mm. That's what I think he's going to do. I think he's going to sit back, enjoy the position enjoy he's the got glory. himself in. Yeah, because he's, he's very loved, isn't he? Oh, well, loved his Marmite, isn't he? Marmite is, is a good way of putting um, it. But whatever you think of his politics, he's actually quite a nice fella, mm. I have to say. Very charismatic. He's very charismatic. Doesn't mean you've got to agree with him. Um, anyway, send us your thoughts on that. Um, gbnews.com slash your say. We're getting used to it, aren't we? We are getting used to it. Um, now, the controversial NFL star OJ Simpson has died at the age of 76 following a battle with cancer. Yes, back in 1995, Simpson was acquitted for double murder of his ex-wife and her friend in a sensational case that divided America. Well, on uh, X, his family said, uh, our father, Orantal James Simpson, succumbed to his battle with cancer. He was surrounded by his children and grandchildren. During this time of transition, his family asked that you please respect their wishes for privacy and grace. Well, we're now joined by Royal and Showbiz reporter Kinsey Schofield, who joins us live now. Good to see you, Kinsey. I mean, we do need to remember in all of this, there is a family at the heart of all of this that are grieving. But looking at the front pages of the newspapers this morning here in the UK, it is O.J. Simpson on trial uh, after, before he was acquitted of, of double murder. Uh, it was a trial that, that gripped America and gripped the world. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, several of the people that have spoken out about the death of O.J. Simpson were kind enough to acknowledge those families, uh, specifically Cato Kalin, who became ridiculously famous throughout that that trial. I don't know if you remember, but uh, there was a poll conducted that at the time 74% of Americans could identify Cato Kalin, who was OJ's roommate and testified throughout the trial. At the time, only 25% could identify our vice president, Al Gore. Uh, but Cato Kalin commenting on it, sending his condolences to uh, Ron Goldman's family and to uh, Nicole's family, saying, you know, beautiful Nicole, that he had them in their thoughts and prayers along with O.J. Simpson's children, um, Marsha Clark, who was the prosecutor, also acknowledging the Simpson family uh, throughout this and, and the victim's family. Uh, Caitlyn Jenner, who was friends with O.J., uh, married to Chris Jenner. They vacationed together, tweeting good riddance. Uh, and controversial TV personality Mark Lamont Hill, he tweeted something, uh, I mean, very controversial. He said, O.J. Simpson was an abusive liar who abandoned his community long before he killed two people in cold blood. But he says his acquittal for murder was the correct and necessary result of a racial criminal legal system. Uh, he's still a monster, not a martyr. So a lot of, a, a variety of reaction here in the United States after the death of O.J. Simpson. I mean, that's the bottom line, isn't it, with all of this? I mean, obviously, he was found uh, liable in a, in a civil trial afterwards, which, which obviously cost him his fortune. Um, but the bottom line is he was acquitted, but everyone, everyone thought he did it. Well, and then you saw in that 2007 arrest for kidnapping and armed robbery, he was sentenced to 33 years, and he had to spend nine years in jail for that. And public-wise, I feel like everybody really considered that his punishment for the death of Nicole and Ron, despite the fact that it was, and it was for kidnapping and armed robbery in Vegas. Um, but, it, you know, he, he he's going to be remembered not for the charming movie star that he once was, or that, you know, he was a great football commentator and incredible incredible football player for 11 years, a pro football Hall of Famer. He won't be remembered for that. Ultimately, he's going to be remembered for the death of Nicole Brown Simpson and Ronald Goldman. OK, Kinsey Schofield, good to see you this morning. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. I remember that news coming through. I was working in radio at really? the time. And, and everyone was just amazed that he'd, that he'd yeah. got away with it, basically. I mean, look at the evidence now. I know.
Wasn't well, it fibres and Oh, there's loads, hair there was and... loads of stuff. And it was just the, the gloves that were the big I mean, issue. Oh, there you see the pictures of the gloves It's now. all over the front pages this morning. Try the gloves on and the gloves didn't fit. And what, the, was, and what was that? If the gloves don't fit, you must acquit. You must acquit, yeah. And it is, it's the defence lawyers that became so famous in all of this as well. You know, mm. Robert Kardashian and the likes, they, they made their names oh, yeah. uh, in this trial. And they became synonymous with O.J. Simpson, didn't they? Mm. Um, it's fascinating. It truly is. And it's so interesting as well to see what his legacy is. As Kinsey was saying, he won't be remembered as an NFL star or a movie star. No, no, no. He's remembered for that trial. Yeah, absolutely. This image of holding up the gloves, I mean, it's all over the papers this morning. Do let us oh. know what you think. Heck, from 30 years ago. Mm. It's extraordinary. Mm. OK, uh, look, we're going to see what the weather's going to do for you today, because, as I was saying, according to the star, hot weather is on the way. Let's get the details from Alex. <laughs> A brighter outlook with Bob Solar, sponsors of weather on GB News. Morning. Here's your latest GB News weather update brought to you by the Met Office. A bit of a north-south split as we go through today and into the weekend. Some dry, fine weather towards the south, wetter further north. This morning there are heavy outbreaks of rain pushing across parts of Northern Ireland into Northern England and across the bulk of Scotland, though northeastern parts clinging on to some sunshine into the afternoon. Do watch out for some strong gusty winds in the northwest. Across the bulk of England and Wales, lots of fine and at times sunny weather into this afternoon and temperatures rising to highs of around 20, 21, possibly even 22 Celsius towards the southeast. Everywhere, temperatures will be well above average for the time of year. Sticking with the north-south split as we go through the end of the day and into tomorrow, further rain across northern parts, particularly across the borders area, likely to see some heavy bursts for a time and showers feeding in from the northwest. Staying drier towards the south and there will be some clear skies, but quite a bit of cloud and we have mild air across us, so temperatures not dropping a huge amount for most places. Through Saturday itself then, a bit of cloud bringing some drizzly rain across northern and western parts of England and Wales perhaps. Towards the southeast though, lots of fine and at times sunny weather again. The more unsettled picture will be once more across parts of Scotland and Northern Ireland. Here some hefty showery rain pushing its way through and temperatures for many will be down a touch compared to today. As we go into Sunday and we're going to see further showers which could be heavy at times across northern areas, drier towards the south but temperatures dropping compared to recent. That warm feeling inside from Boxed Boilers, sponsors of weather on GB News. Now, a huge congratulations to Victoria from Hertfordshire, who won our spring giveaway. Does that mean she got the pizza oven? It does mean she got the pizza oven. Oh, You're very Victoria. jealous, Victoria. Victoria. Well, we called her yesterday to let her know. This is how she reacted. Victoria, I've got some really good news for you. You're the winner of the Great British Giveaway. Oh, my God, are you joking? You've won £12,345. Yeah. You've won £500 to spend in the store of your choice. Oh, my God. You've won a pizza oven, a games console, and you've also won a smart speaker. Oh, my God. This is amazing. What, what do you think you might spend the money on? Oh, we're going to Disney. It's not paid for yet. So this will pay for it. Thank you. Oh, isn't that wonderful? Pizza oven. You don't He's need just that. Too you jealous. don't need the pizza oven, Victoria. Maybe invite him round for a sort of pizza, <laughs> pizza in the garden. <laughs> he'd, be, he'd love that. Anyway, well done, Victoria. She was our latest winner. You could be our next one. Here's how you could win our biggest prize of the year so far. Yes, your chance to win ten thousand pounds in cash, a luxury travel items, and a twenty twenty five Greek cruise worth ten thousand pounds. So if you do the maths, it all adds up to more than twenty grand, mm. and it could be yours. Here's how. Variety Cruises have been sailing since 1942, and thanks to them, you could set sail in 2025. You have the chance to win a seven-night small boat cruise for two worth £10,000. With your flights, meals, drinks and excursions included, you can choose from any one of their 2025 Greek adventures and find your home at sea. You'll also win an incredible £10,000 in tax-free cash that you can use to make this summer spectacular. We'll also treat you to these luxury travel gifts. 
gifts. For another chance to win a prize worth over £20,000, text WIN to 63232. Text costs £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB04 PO Box 8690 Derby DE1 9 UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5pm on the 26th of April. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if listening or watching on demand. Good luck. Yes, good luck indeed. Now, still to come, Britain's newest defence weapon. What is it? We're going to find out next on GB News. Good afternoon, Britain. Weekdays from midday. I wonder, is this the fundamental distinction we need to make between Islam, which is a, a, a private religion, people may practice freely uh, amongst themselves, and Islamism, when you try and place those values upon other people, place that, that way of being, force it on people who don't want it? Um, I have been very much clear about this thing that Islam is a religion and people are free to follow that religion in the UK, in a Western, free Western society. So we, we have no problem with people following their religion as long as it is not being imposed mm. onto the wider society. And when you want, uh, you talk about uh, drawing a distinction between Islam and Islamism, people like me, you and me, we are drawing that distinction. We're trying to maintain that distinction. But if you uh, look at the commentator from the Muslim community, some commentator, they would like to blur this line and they would ask you, what is Islamism? Where does it exist? Sorry, it does exist. Mm. We see it. And the teacher of this incident is an epitome of that kind of, you know, ideology being prevalent, you know, in, in our Khadija, society. Khadija, do you worry so, that there are, that these views are typical for some sections of society? Do you think that there's a problem with some Muslim men that they have perhaps uh, views that we don't consider to be British values? There are certain readings of religion which are misogynistic, which are discriminatory, which are homophobic. We need to be honest about it. We need to be calling it out whenever we hear these kind of views. It's been a long time that we are letting these kind of ideologies crawling in, you know, um, spreading tentacles in British society, and we are just ignoring it in the name of respecting people's culture and mm. religion. You are not suppressing the UK. Now, with Labour's pledges towards defence spending hitting the headlines this morning, you might not have heard about Britain's new military laser. Mm. It's called the Dragonfire. Oh, well, the Defence Secretary said it could be rushed into active service in Ukraine for real-world combat testing, following President Zelensky's plea for more air defences. Now, let's talk to defence analyst Chris Newton, who joins us now. What is Dragonfire, Chris? How does it work? Um, good morning. Dragon of Fire, it's um, a laser weapon, it's a directed energy weapon um, and effectively how it works is that you direct a, a beam of energy, a beam of light on, onto the target, say for example a drone and that either disables or cuts uh, through the, the, the target um, and re renders the target um, ineffective. And, and it has um, many kind of advantages over conventional air defense systems. For example, it's much cheaper. Um, the MOD states it's like 10, 10 pounds uh, per shot, um, whereas missiles cost sort of hundreds of thousands of, of pounds, up, up to a million, million pounds. Um, it's, it's fast, it's accurate. Um, and un and you don't have to worry about running out of ammunition. There are limitations as well, which we might want to go into. Yes, what are they? Um, as, essentially, you need a clear line of sight. Um, you um, the the effectiveness of the laser can be affected by, for example, rain, fog, sm uh, smoke, those kinds of things. It, 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 because it, it produces a lot of heat. Um, you need cooling system, and and you need you know a lot of energy also to 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 power the weapon and to and to and to fire the weapon. 
So, so it's not a panacea. There are limitations. It's going to be used as part of an integrated kind of um, system of weapons. So it's not going to be the absolute perfect solutions solution, but it's it's an imp it's an important development nonetheless. But it could have huge ramifications, couldn't it, for the conflict in Ukraine? Um, we'll we'll have to see about that. I mean the. Uh, the, the dates that Grant Shapps has in mind is 2027, and we'll have to see whether the war, is, you know, continues um, uh, to, to that extent. Um, but but if um, if they're able to roll it out quicker, and and, the, and if the wars, uh, the war in Ukraine continues, then then yes, it would be a, a, an important capability for Ukraine, given that, for example, at the moment, one of its key problems is, is that it's running out of air defence ammunition, and Zelensky keeps, you know, keeps asking the West for more um, air defence systems and more air defence um, ammunition. So, so and, and, and given that Russia is, is also conducting a strategic air campaign, um, particularly against, um, at the moment, energy uh, targets, this kind of thing would be absolutely kind of ideal for, for Ukraine. But again, it's part of an overall system. It's not a, a panacea. It's not a perfect solution. It's going to be used, uh, you know, with, with all of the conventional weapons as well. OK, okay Chris, really good to see you. Thanks very much indeed. Good to see you. It's very Star Wars, well, I isn't thought it? you'd like that. Yeah. It looks good. They've been talking about stuff like that for years. Oh. Big, it's, it's getting the lasers to... Oscillate the right way. Oscillate. Oh right, yeah. All very, very technical. But I, I mean, wow! I mean, it would be amazing, wouldn't it? Yeah. Possibly slightly frightening. Yes. Well, it does look slightly frightening. It's cheaper as well. But cheaper. I mean, ten quid a shot. Ten quid a shot. Yeah. Is um, huge. A lot cheaper than missiles, isn't it? Oof, God, yeah. We take a look at the sport. Aidan McGee is here with us. Good to see you this morning. Good to see you both. And Harry Kane, his children are oh, fine, thank goodness. They are. A bit of a worry. Thank goodness, as you say. You're absolutely right there, Ellie, because this is a deeply distressing story that actually happened on Monday night when Harry Kane arrived in London to line up for in preparation for Bayern Munich's clash against Arsenal the night after. So I think when he landed at the airport, he heard that his three children had been involved in a crash. They're seven, five and three, oh. uh, Ivy, Vivienne and They're Louis. They're tiny. They are indeed. And so a local fire uh, official said that, that it's very lucky there weren't any fatalities. There were three cars involved, a Renault, uh, a Mercedes, which was carrying the three children, and a uh, Land Rover. So, yeah, we had some... We, we, there was an announcement from Kane's spokespeople last night saying, saying that there was a crash, but the kids are fine and nobody was uh, injured. And, of course, he, he lined up against Arsenal on Tuesday and managed to score a goal. So it's a tribute to the professionalism, with all that going on oh. in the background, to go and score a goal at uh, Arsenal. We're, we're hoping for maybe an update uh, later on but at the moment, we think things are OK. Oh, well, thank heavens. He's such a likeable bloke as well, isn't he? Yeah, yeah, yeah but, I mean, you wouldn't... I mean, it's awful, especially, especially with children Indeed. involved. And um, let's have a look at the Europa... Uh, Europa <laughs> Europa League. Eureka! It was a grim reaper for uh, Liverpool. Oh, chances, oh, very good. Very good. Very good. Look, Liverpool had a big chance last night. I mean, they want to win a Europa... A Europa your European trophy. <laughs> I'm setting you up now. Yeah. It's that early in the morning, isn't it? Uh, look, they had a big chance last night to, to move into or take a big step into the Europa League semi-finals, and quite frankly, Stephen, they blew it. I mean, they left uh, Trent Alexander-Arnold on the bench, Diaz on the bench, Jota, Salah, Robertson, Shabozlai. That, to me, is underestimating your opponents. Atalanta, who have no discernible European pedigree going back for decades. They're only six in the Serie A uh, championship in, in Italy. They're 22 points behind Inter Milan. So they're not particularly pulling up trees over there in terms of competing at the elite level, yet they turn up at Anvil last night and they demonstrate a ruthless display of counter-attacking football. I think this might be the last European match you saw at Anfield last night under Jurgen Klopp, and that's a great shame, uh, because I don't think they're going to turn this round in the second leg. That's a really tough trip. And if you look at... I mean, OK, he'll probably turn around to me and say, well, I had to rest these players because we've got Crystal Palace on, uh, on Sunday. We've got, so they've got four, four away trips. Atalanta, they're going to try and turn that situation around. They've got Fulham... Everton, West Ham, all away matches. So it's going to be difficult. They've played 56 games already, but that seriously backfired on them last night. And I think you'll really regret that in a couple of weeks when their exit is, uh, is confirmed. Uh, and it's a huge shame in terms of the whole point of, of Jurgen Klopp announcing his retirement was that everyone could galvanise around him and push mm. him over the line. They're still very much in there in the Premier League, of course, but that was a devastating blow last night. And just in any other game, West Ham, big disappointment as well, sailing along in the Europa League. 
And they were at home to buy Leverkusen and uh, sorry, away to buy Leverkusen. They lost uh, two 0 I don't think Leverkusen played played particularly well, but an awful night for uh, English clubs in in Europe. Although Aston Villa did win. Uh, their, their game against Lille and well, well Prince, we know why. Uh, well, Prince William yeah. was there. He does go to He's quite a few games. You know. He yeah. does go to quite a few games. I've seen, I've seen him there. Have you? Oh, I have seen him there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, uh, we didn't have a chat or anything, but no. <laughs> oh well, good on him. Uh, I'm glad he's getting out and about and doing a few things. Yes, it's a good sign, isn't it? I he's think he's got a lot on his plate. Yeah. Um, lovely, Aidan. We'll leave it there for now, but we will see you later on. Absolutely. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much, much indeed. indeed. Now, still to come. Should you be able to swim to join the Navy? We're going to be discussing that next in the papers. The latest GB News travel. Good morning, I'm Russell Holding. In the Highland, the A87 is partly blocked where there was an accident by the Rassi Ferry at Sconce. There's just one lane open, so temporary lights in place to control the traffic. In Londonderry, the A515 is closed in both directions over the Foil Bridge between the Core and Carmel Road roundabouts for emergency repairs. The M62 on Merseyside is closed eastbound at Junction 7 for the A57 at Rainhill Stoops. After an accident, diversions are often back on by the slip roads. On the M27 in Hampshire, there's no fuel eastbound at the Roundham services between junctions 3 and 4. Also in Hampshire, the A3090 is closed along Winchester Hill past Romsey Hospital after an accident yesterday evening. And that's the latest. You can stay up to date throughout the day by visiting our website gbnews.com. I'm Patrick Christie's. Every weeknight from nine, I bring you two hours of unmissable, explosive debate and headline-grabbing interviews. What impact has that had? We got death threats and the bomb threats and so on. Our job is to do what's in the best interest of our country. You made well, my I'm argument for me. My guests and I tackle the issues that really matter with a sharp take on every story. I'm hearing up and down the country that was a beginning, not an end. Patrick Christie's tonight from 9 p.m. only on GB News, Britain's news channel. Are the newspapers getting you down? My wife didn't divorce me that month. <laughs> <laughs> Struggling to separate the wheat from the chaff. I know that it's a bit of a circus at the best of times. <laughs> well, don't worry. Headliners has got you covered. We'll take the burden of reading the day's news, and if we get depressed, who cares? It's an occupational hazard, frankly. That's Headliners on GB News from 11pm till midnight, and the following morning, 5 till 6am, on GB News, the comedy channel. Nah, just kidding. Britain's news channel. Oh, welcome back. It's yes. six forty-two. Yes, and loads You're of you. Right. Get, loads of you getting in touch on gbnews.com/slash your say, including Kenny. Oh yeah. Who says I just want to say mm. how great it is to see Ellie grow to become oh. a great <laughs> presenter on GB News. Thanks, You've grown. Kenny. Says Dicko's been around forever. <laughs> Dicko. Thanks very much indeed. That's very nice. Oh, thanks, Kenny. That's very kind. That's nice to you, Dicko. Thank you. Well, I Dicko. Thought... I think that's a term of endearment. I just... I, am I a veteran now? I still think I've just started. I think I'm No, I think, I think you're, you're very good at your job. Uh, you, you... And experienced. I always experience. say that to you. <laughs> experience. But he did start doing oh. it when he was about 12, to be fair. Oh, 18. <laughs> exactly. He was a child. A child. So, yes, you have been doing a little, a little while. Yeah. Oh, well, that's, a, that's a good thing. I'm knocking on, ladies yeah. and gents. I'm <laughs> Burned your on. stripes. Oh, oh, yeah. But thanks, Kenny. That's very kind. Uh, do keep compliments coming our way. <laughs> <laughs> what is it? GB News. I need to get used to it. GBnews.com slash your search. That's it. Uh, now, we need it a, printed somewhere. Let's have a look at the papers this morning. The UK's nuclear deterrent is safe in my hands, says Sir Keir Starmer. That's in the Daily Mail. In the Telegraph, border force are to blame for the fake stamps sweeping across Britain with Royal Mail accusing the government of not doing enough. The Express calling for an end to what they call the triple lock pension injustice, saying millions won't get the full increase. It's not all rosy for Labour. They could lose a number of urban seats over their stances on Gaza and climate change. That's according to The Guardian. And The Mirror has OJ Simpson uh, dying at the age of 76. 
Well, joining us now to go through what's making the news this morning is GB News senior political commentator Nigel Nelson and former government advisor Claire Pearce, a real-life husband and wife team. And we love having them on the programme. Thanks so much well, thank for joining us. Uh, Claire, let's start with you, shall we? The front page of The Guardian, not all looking rosy for Labour. But I think this is not a surprise mm. and any politician that goes in assuming that their seat is safe I think is misguided at the very best and I think Labour have really got to look at where their policies are going wrong because their big U-turn on the climate change spending, unfunded spending, um, has had huge implications. There are an awful lot of people who are looking to Labour to be that voice of green technology and investment in those areas. And when you look at the seats and the demographic of especially young people, that's what they really wanted to see. So you're looking at um, places like Sheffield, but also down towards Bristol, maybe Peterborough, which Labour looks set to take. They're not quite so sure on that now. So young people are not convinced that Labour are going to offer them the sort of panacea that they believed. I think also the problems in some seats with um, Labour's stance on the Israel-Gaza conflict are going to cause some problems, just simply with the demographic, the Muslim population, they're not particularly happy. They don't like the Tories, so it, it's unclear as to where their votes are going to go. But I do think that this is pretty basic politics, that you cannot take your electorate for granted. You need to be able to put the policies forward that people understand and people want. And, and at the moment, unfortunately, Labour just aren't doing that. Mm. Nigel? Yeah, I, I mean, I sort of agree, but the, um, it, the it, I think your, your key point there, Claire, was where you said, well, where do they go? Um, so if you've got, got uh, a lot of Muslim voters in Labour constituencies who um, are furious about the situation in Gaza, they're hardly going to go and vote Tory. Um, the, the climate change people, if you've got younger people who are concerned that Labour are not doing enough about climate change, and I agree about the about not spending the $28 billion. I regret the fact that they've um, reversed that. Um, but again, where do they go? That, the, that at least Labour have got a policy whereby um, they have got a green policy. I mean, you, that, that you will get sort of double the amount of onshore wind, um, triple the amount of solar, quadruple the amount of offshore wind. And so if you were going for the climate change party, you'd end up going for Labour anyway. But it's not oh. just that, and it's all very well to say that Labour have got uh, a green policy. Well, currently have a green policy, because I think, as we've seen, they flip-flop round what their policies are, they change their minds, well, they of bow course, to pressure. because they're trying to win you lot over. Oh, that's not going to happen, though, is it? People like me sitting there going, but we can see through that. And I, and I, and I think it's very, very difficult. Labour don't really understand what it is they want to be. They don't want to be the Corbynistic sort of era of Labour. They don't want to be Tony Blair, no, Keir Starr. No, they don't, because they don't want to be tarred with that, because that then offends a lot of people on the Corbyn side. It's a very difficult mix. And I think want Starmer the wants to party. make it his own, and he's not doing And that's the that. whole point about the green agenda. The one that, that Instead of thinking of it just necessarily as an environmental thing, about how we can actually grow the economy through investing in green industry, that way we could lead the world because that's the direction of travel the globe is going in. Mm -hmm. Oh, talking of, of global travel, Nigel, <laughs> in The Telegraph this morning, Kevin MacLeod, who lots of us enjoy watching on his um, house-building shows, uh, he says, if you're a first-time buyer, you should move to Germany. To get on the housing ladder. Yes, apparently. I don't know if that's been well thought through. <laughs> <laughs> well, in fact, houses in Germany are actually much more expensive. Um, the, the average house price here is 288,000. In London, that goes up to 730,000. Right. And if you want to live in Kensington, you're looking at over a million, a million quid to actually do that. So what he's, say, what he's saying is that if you are a first-time buyer. It'll take you 31 years to get a deposit by saving 10% of your income. Answer, go over to a place like Germany where half the people there rent. So you rent instead. There are other places in Europe where you can do the same thing. Mm. In America, it's, it, 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 it's, it's uh, really popular. So renting there is a, is a different alternative. But what, is it a lot cheaper? Um, it's not so much cheaper, but what's, easier. But what's the advantage then? 
Well, the only advantage is, is you get a home. That if you can't get a home here on the basis that to own one costs so much money. We've got this thing about... The Brits have got this thing about home ownership. Um, it doesn't exist in other parts of the world... No. ..where you actually can rent a place rather than have to, have to go out and buy it. You can rent a place. I don't understand the point it's making. I think it's the availability of properties. In Germany, they build, which is something that we don't do in the United Kingdom. And as Nigel said, in all fairness, it is much easier and more acceptable to rent in places like Germany. I just think it, it, it's more to do with the availability, the sort of planning and the infrastructure for housing seems to be better thought through. And it's that sort of the old adage of the German efficiency. They put things near train stations, they have buses that run. It, it's more set up in, in the planning respect. They don't have quite as many problems as we do uh, with planning laws. Um, countryside, we have designated areas of countryside that we're not going to touch, like the green belts. In Germany, it's not quite like that. They see the need for housing and they say, OK, we are going to build a set of properties, and, and that's what they go and do. So I think it's probably just easier to get one. I don't necessarily think it's cheaper, and as you say, it's not really particularly well thought through, considering you'd now have to get a visa to um, go and live there anyway. And, and a job. Of, yes, uh, yes, yes. And speak the language. Yes. It's a little bit tricky if you're not going to have all of those things. I mean, it's a nice thought, but I think uh, Kevin McLeod needs to stick to the designing of houses, which is far better. Yes. Yeah, maybe best. Um, Claire, let's stick with you, shall we? The front page of The Telegraph, uh, the Navy to hire recruits who can't swim. Oh, no, see, this has been one of the funniest things I've seen for some time, mm. is the Royal you Navy... don't need to swim. They're going to be so on go boats. on a big ship. <laughs> oh, no, I'm, I think ship, it's, yeah. it's a ship. A ship, boats are submarines. What are they boats? Boats. <laughs> yeah. It kind of feels like a really basic premise that you're yeah. going to go into the Royal Navy. At some point, you may enter the water, mm. and the need to swim, I would suggest, is quite high and basic. You'd think what? you'd want to, wouldn't you? Yeah, I mean, what they're doing is they're removing... Might fall off your ship or something. Yeah. yeah well, yeah. Could well do. You need to go and rescue somebody. That happens. But I, I think that what they're doing is removing the need for a 30-minute swimming test and people who cannot swim at the moment cannot apply. They're going to remove that barrier and say that you can learn to swim with the Navy. With the Navy. Yeah. Which kind of makes sense a little bit, apart from their training is then going to be so much longer. Well, not that they do. It's be really intensive. It be would fine. be, you but what, what happens if you find that somebody really just isn't competent in the water? Then you have to get rid of them. Yeah. You can't do anything with them. I, I think that if you're going into the Navy, it's like going into the Air Force and being afraid of flying. It's like household cavalry. You don't have to be able to ride a horse in the household cavalry. They train no. you to do it. They do, and they train them very, very well, I have to admit. I mean, they are some pretty good riders and some pretty stand you know, stunning horses. But it, it, it does seem a real basic thing. If you're going to go into the Navy, you need to have a respect of the water. Well, a respect, well, yes. 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 Now, just how you fix the, st the staffing shortage in the Navy? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, it is 22%. There's a problem with the problem with the with with that. So, uh, to an extent, you could actually understand why they're making it easier for people to be recruited. Um, but yes, what do you do if somebody at the end of the day just can't swim at all, mm. even after being trained? <laughs> Put them in the galley. <laughs> yes, I should think the ship still may sink, though. <laughs> well, they swear, yeah. you know. there you go, um, Nigel. Triple lock in the express. Um, there's triple lock in justice, apparently. Yes, they, they, this is all to do with... I mean, because they've made pensions so complicated, uh, all to do with the new pension and the old pension. The old pension, that which you would have got um, uh, before April 16th, if you, uh, April 19, uh, 2016, if you retire there. Um, so what's happened is that the, trip, the triple lock doesn't, in, doesn't totally... Uh, kick in for old pensions where it does for new, which means that some pensioners are uh, uh, more than two and a half grand, um, getting two and a half grand less than the new pensions. The new pensions brought in just to simplify things because uh -huh. it, was so, it was getting so complicated. I mean, the question really will come down to can we afford to keep the triple lock? Um, and it goes I hate, on. I hate to say it, but it's not, I think probably not. 
it, it's one of those things that nobody wants to be the person to turn mm. around and say, we can't afford this, I'm sorry, pensioners, you're not, we're going to get rid of the triple lock. It's very, very difficult, to, especially in an election year, no-one's going to touch that subject no. of first, older first, people. First year of a Labour government with a 200-seat majority, though, they could get away with it. Well, I mean, yeah. the, the, the whole thing is it, it is it is incredibly expensive. Over the, the last... Um, uh, since 2011, the the 2.5 percent, the minimum guarantee, uh, has been used three times. That means that pensions have gone up 60 percent mm. compared to what they would have done about 40 percent had it been done just on inflation mm. and slightly less if it had been done on earnings. Mm. So keep the double lock, earnings, inflation, so pensioners get an increase there. But the 2.5 percent is a bit. I think may, may have had its day. Oh, you'll have a view on that. GBnews.com slash your say. Really rolled off the tongue there, Mark. I'm trying. <laughs> You're doing better than I am, to be fair. Uh, Claire, we've just got minutes. Let's talk about uh, Nike, Nike, shall we? And this is uh, a British Paralympian is urging Nike to introduce single trainer sales. Which really makes sense. Uh, mm. Nike are using uh, mannequins in their stores who have the running blades to show right. that people with disabilities can absolutely be top sports people. And that's fantastic, apart from the the fact that they only sell their shoes in pairs. Yeah. And one of the leading athletes has said, that's that's great, I love the diversity, I love that you're using that model, uh, please may I buy one Any shoe. shoe. Mm. And uh, nobody can make a decision, it's gone to all of the, the heads of Nike, the really big, important bosses, and everybody's just sort of sat there scratching their heads and haven't given her an answer. Oh, well, well, been... well, Nike have now responded, sorry, uh, Nigel, to cut across you there, uh, saying they thank the Olympian for sharing her concerns. It is available in the US in Memphis, hoping to expand the programme to more geographies in the future. Oh, well, there you go. There you um, go. Good to see you both. See you a little bit later on. Here's your weather. A brighter outlook with Bob Solar and sponsors of weather on GB News. Morning. Here's your latest GB News weather update brought to you by the Met Office. A bit of a north-south split as we go through today and into the weekend. Some dry, fine weather towards the south, wetter further north. This morning there are heavy outbreaks of rain pushing across parts of Northern Ireland into Northern England and across the bulk of Scotland, though northeastern parts clinging on to some sunshine into the afternoon. Do watch out for some strong gusty winds in the northwest. Across the bulk of England and Wales, lots of fine and at times sunny weather into this afternoon and temperatures rising to highs of around 20, 21, possibly even 22 Celsius towards the southeast. Everywhere, temperatures will be well above average for the time of year. Sticking with the north-south split as we go through the end of the day and into tomorrow, further rain across northern parts, particularly across the borders area, likely to see some heavy bursts for a time and showers feeding in from the northwest. Staying drier towards the south and there will be some clear skies, but quite a bit of cloud and we have mild air across us, so temperatures not dropping a huge amount for most places. Through Saturday itself then, a bit of cloud bringing some drizzly rain across northern and western parts of England and Wales perhaps. Towards the southeast though, lots of fine and at times sunny weather again. The more unsettled picture will be once more across parts of Scotland and Northern Ireland. Here some hefty showery rain pushing its way through and temperatures for many will be down a touch compared to today. As we go into Sunday and we're going to see further showers which could be heavy at times across northern areas, drier towards the south but temperatures dropping compared to recent. That warm feeling in Side. From Boxed Boilers, sponsors of weather on GB News. The latest GB News travel. Good morning, I'm Russell Holding. In the Highland, the A87 is partly blocked after an accident by Deep Ransey Ferry. Uh, Sconser, it's down to a single lane with temporary traffic lights to control deep traffic. In Londonderry, the A515 is closed in both directions over the Foyle Bridge for emergency repairs. In the West Midlands, New Street in Dudley is closed between Priory Street and the High Street for an investigation. Tower Street also closed there. In Powys, the A4067 is closed in both directions at Astra Gunless because of a land slip. On the M27 in Hampshire, there's no fuel eastbound at the Realm Services between junctions 3 and 4. And also in Hampshire, Winchester Hill is closed in both directions past Romsey Hospital after an accident yesterday evening. That's the latest. You can stay up to date throughout the day by visiting our website 
gbnews.com. Variety Cruises have been sailing since 1942, and thanks to them, you could set sail in 2025. You have the chance to win a seven-night small boat cruise for two worth £10,000. With your flights, meals, drinks and excursions included, you can choose from any one of their 2025 Greek adventures and find your home at sea. You'll also win an incredible £10,000 in tax-free cash that you can use to make this summer spectacular. We'll also treat you to these luxury travel gifts. For another chance to win a prize worth over £20,000, text PRIZE to 63232. Text costs £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB04, PO Box 8690, Derby DE1 9 UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5pm on the 26th of April. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if listening or watching on demand. Good luck. Good morning to you. It's 7 o'clock on Friday the 12th of April. Today, Sir Keir Starmer pledges to boost military spending to 2.5% as he says the country's nuclear deterrent is safe in his hands. Polls show that the Conservatives are no longer trusted on defence, so can Labour steal their clothes? Find out more with me very soon. Controversial NFL star O.J. Simpson, who was cleared of murdering his ex-wife and her friend in a criminal trial, dies at the age of 76 following a battle with cancer. People in Portland are furious over what they deem to be a luxury-free bus service that ferries asylum seekers around. Men are up in arms over a woman's social media page that calls out exes on bad behaviour. We're asking, should people really name and shame their old flames? A news presenter, Rachel Burden, says having a baby at 41 was really selfish. So we'll debate that later on. And we meet Britain's first woman to surf a 60-foot wave in Portugal, Laura Crane. Some warm sunshine across southern parts as we head into the weekend, but a wetter story further north. I'll have more in the full forecast shortly. Good morning to you. I'm Stephen Dixon. And I'm Ellie Costello, and this is Breakfast on GB News. Dawn's been in touch. Oh, yeah. Good morning, Dawn. She, she loves the show. Ah, Dawn. Uh, but I don't understand why you've got all pots and pans on the set. Um, wish it was more modern and you had an oval table. I think we'd all like an oval table. I, do you know what? I'd like a sofa. You and I on the sofa. The only problem with that is I'd have to wear shoes and I'm wearing trainers. It's all about comfort. Come on, comfort. Um, yes, I know. Uh, pots of... Well, it's... I, I wish I could give you an answer, Dawn. Oh, I've got an answer. How oh, have you? I think it's so it looks as though we're sat in our own kitchen. Does it? And then you, in turn, feel like you're sat around the kitchen table with us. Oh, there you go. There you go. Um, um, I heard that from someone once, so I'm just regurgitating that information. Right. I think we are getting a redesign at some point. <laughs> yes, yes. So, um, oh, talk about Navy and um, you not being able to swim, joining the Navy. It's this new thing. It's not going to be a requirement. Lorraine says, my uncle was an engineer in the Navy in World War II and used to have to go under the ship at times and he couldn't swim. They used to just tie a rope around him. Oh, my goodness. So, there you go. It's not a new thing, apparently. Wow. Yeah, I'm not sure about that one. I would think that would be one of the most basic requirements. You can swim to be in the Navy, mm. but you think you can learn on the job. You're OK with that, aren't you? Yeah, I think you can, we can train you on the job. Also, on the pensions thing, mm. triple lock, uh, which is issues around the triple lock. Neil Bishop says, instead of getting rid of the triple lock, why not do away with gold-plated pensions for civil servants and MPs, etc., and level up so that all pensioners are equal? But their workplace pensions is not state... It's all about state pension, isn't it, the triple lock? Mm. No, not not your workplace pension. So the two That's don't separate, like, yeah. it, it's, it's not quite the same, Neil. But I, I know what you mean. The gold-plated pensions for some people um, are a bit annoying. Mm. 
Um, there is a new way of getting in touch with us, which we are still getting used to. In fact, the producers have had to print me out in very bold, big writing, which is gbnews.com slash your say. Uh, so this is the new way of getting in touch. We're no longer using email. That's the good old days, isn't it? Good this way you can talk to each other, it's like not a forum. just us. Yeah, it's very, very good. So here's how you can get in touch. We are proud to be GB News, the people's channel. And as you know, we always love to hear your views. Now, there's a new way of getting in touch with us at gbnews.com forward slash your say. By commenting, you can be part of a live conversation and join our GB News community. You can even talk to me, Bev Turner, or any of the members of the GB News family. Simply go to gbnews.com forward slash your say. So that's how you get in touch. and we we'll look forward to hearing from you this morning. Now, to our top story today, and the Labour leader, Sir Keir Starmer, says the UK's nuclear deterrent is the bedrock of his plan to keep Britain safe. Well, it's in stark contrast to the Jeremy Corbyn era, of course, he being a champion of nuclear disarmament. Meanwhile, Sir Keir Starmer said he would like to boost the defence budget to 2.5% of GDP. Well, let's talk to our political correspondent, Olivia Utley, who's in Westminster. I mean, this really is a turnaround, trying to position Labour as the party you can trust with our defence. Well, absolutely. It's a, a huge, huge turnaround. Just a few years ago, Jeremy Corbyn was advocating for complete nuclear disarmament. He wanted to ditch Trident. Now, Keir Starmer is essentially saying that Labour is the party of defence. He says that uh, Labour will put a triple lock on defence. It will uh, rejuvenate the current nuclear submarines as and when they need to be uh, reju rejuvenated. Uh, he will invest in nuclear nuclear submarines, he will keep the Trident programme uh, running and he will build four new sub nuclear submarines in Barrow and Furness. He is also visiting that Barrow and Furness site and he will be the first Labour leader in 30 years to do so. Last month, a poll for the Daily Mail suggested that only 24% of the country trust the Conservatives on defence. Now, that is probably because, time and again, defense, Conservative defence secretaries have called for defence spending to rise to 3% of GDP. But again and again, chancellors have said no. At the moment, it is at 2 percent 3%. Labour is saying that it would raise that to 2.5% and eventually to 3%. So they're putting money where their mouth is. Well, there's a slight caveat to that because Starmer says he can only do it if it fits in with Labour's borrowing rules. This is a massive turnaround for Keir Starmer and a sign that he is trying to take some of those Tory heartland votes uh, from the Conservatives. But of course, in doing so, he risks angering the Labour Party members who tend to be to the left of the Labour Parliamentary Party. You tend to be a bit more of the Corbyn mindset. How will that play out in a general election year? Well, it remains to be seen. But Keir Starmer needs members. He needs loyal members pounding the streets, delivering leaflets, doorstepping, etc. If they all turn against him on this, then he'll have a bit of a problem on his hands. OK, Olivia, for now, thanks very much indeed. Now, at least 10 Conservative MPs will defect to Reform UK if Nigel Farage comes out of retirement to lead the party. Well, that's what one of Mr Farage's biggest former financial backers, all down to the Brexit era, of course, Aaron Banks, said on a podcast with our political editor, Christopher Hope. We've seen one Tory MP defect. I expect to see others. Um, How many more? I think it could be a landslide because you, you're not going to be able to win as a Red Bull Tory... Um, up so how many two Midlands. MPs might defect? So this is where I think you get to an interesting point of view, don't you? Because as reformer approaching the Conservatives in the poll, fast, first past the poll dictates that whoever's in second place, you know, could mm. then potentially get a wave of support from the other party. Mm. Um, but how the heck are you going to win as a Red Bull Tory? You can't. They, they've abandoned it. Their strategy now is to try and retain 150 seats in, in the home counties, which is why they're trying to be a little bit liberal. You know, liberal Democrats have, seem to have vanished into a... So how many do you think oh. Tory MPs might come across to reform well, you, UK you pre election Well, this is the point. You can't win as a Conservative MP up north. Your brand is completely destroyed. I mean, some, some will. Where? I, mean, I don't Whitland. know. I mean, when I say up north, I'm talking about, you know... Yeah, Midlands maybe, northern England, but... Is it, but, that, the po but, but frankly, the polls are suggesting that so the rebel Tories could, are going to be completely could dozens come across? I think more than dozens. Tory MPs I actually say that because 
you know, that they're at a point where they can't win as a conservative, but they might have half a chance as a reform candidate. When you say that, you say that you think. Yeah. Or have you, do you know names that you can't say now or you can well, say I now? I know at least three or four names of... Who are in talks now? Yeah, that people are, are, are talking about that. And I would expect this just to accelerate. But it, it, this is the Farage factor, that if he comes back and then they pick up another two or three points in the polls. So Richard Tice has done a good job, but I, I think the when you see 15 points in the polls, that's really the hope factor that Nigel's coming back. Right. But actually, if he does come back and gets traction and you start to see... I think there's, there's some polls out already saying that they're ahead in with men in the Midlands That's and right. North. That's right, if you break, it down, break it down, they're already leading groups. in certain places. And I think the Tory party have given up on... that They know they're going to lose, so they're trying to focus on, you know, re-emergence of one nation, soft Tory, and the MP for Reigate, you know, it's that kind of mm. Tory MP. So um, to be quite clear, if, if Nigel Farage came to lead Reform UK... Oh, I think 10, I think 10 Tory MPs would walk across the... The, the the thing straight away, and I think as well he that that's part of his calculus. You know, MPs are in contact with him daily about this kind of thing, and I think you know if he does come back, it will be on the back of something fairly spectacular. Well, earlier we spoke to the Labour commentator James Matthewson. It's hopeful thinking, um, to put it mildly, from Aaron Banks. I do think there's some stock in what he has to say. Um, I wouldn't like to be a Tory MP uh, in the Red Wall, coming up to, you know, or, or supposedly the Blue Wall now, as it has been since 2019, um, coming up to this, you know, election, because there is going to be an absolute swathe of them who lose. However, this idea that all of a sudden they're all going to cross the floor and they're going to take a chance... Tory MPs uh, and, and Conservatives notoriously um, play it safe. You know, they, they will put their party before a lot of other things. And I don't think, I would be surprised to see 10 cross the floor just because of Nigel Farage, as appealing as I'm sure uh, Nigel Farage's leadership is to many Tory MPs. I think what's happening now, though, uh, and Aaron Banks did get this bang on, is the fact that the Tories have accepted their fate. The Tory staffers who I speak to on a semi-regular basis have all conceded the fact they're going to lose. They've conceded the fact they're going to get absolutely slaughtered at the election. And the reality is they're just trying to, to make sure they can survive the day so that they can rebuild. The big question for me is, what does this mean for the Tories after that election? Now, the controversial NFL, TV and movie star O.J. Simpson has died at the age of 76 following a battle with cancer. Well, back in 1995, Simpson was acquitted for double murder of his ex-wife and her friend in a sensational case that divided America. Two years later, a civil jury found Simpson liable for wrongful death in that double murder. Well, his family put a statement out on X saying, uh, our father, Orental James Simpson, succumbed to his battle with cancer, surrounded by his children and grandchildren. During this time of transition, his family asks that you please respect their wishes for privacy and grace. Well, we're now joined by lawyer Carol Kilgore. Good to see you this morning, Carol. I mean, it's a complicated <laughs> legacy, isn't it? I mean, you can hear the grief of the, of the family there, of the children and the grandchildren. And you remember an NFL star, a movie star. But really, most people around the world will know O.J. Simpson for this moment in that criminal trial where he was acquitted of double murder. That's right. Everybody remembers where they were when the verdict um, was read, uh, even people that weren't in the US at the time. And it was, as you said, sensational, um, because a few years earlier was the Rodney King um, <clears throat> beating and there were race riots in LA. And it does feel like that was kind of the beginnings of all of what we're experiencing now with a lot of the controversy around race in America. I heard that someone make the argument that because the, the Rodney King, the, the, I mean, there was video of this man being attacked by mm -hmm. white police officers, and yet they were acquitted. Yes. Um, I, I, I heard some commentary saying, in a way, that the O.J. Simpson acquittal was people trying to balance the books, okay, if that's, you like. That, that's probably an accurate estimation. Although there were other issues, uh, of course, uh, rather than race around the trial. I mean, there was the whole defence team of uh, 
Um, O.J. Simpson, if you uh, ever watch shows like The Kardashians, mm. you know, you're, you're watching that legacy of um, those very famous lawyers. And it was one of those situations where the actual legal team became as famous as the celebrity um, defendant. Mm. No, that is, is such an interesting take from all of this. I mean, uh, talking about attorneys, Gloria Allred, who's the attorney who represented Nicole Brown Simpson's family uh, during that murder trial, uh, says that this whole case uh, served as a reminder that the justice system failed women and allowed celebrity men to avoid true justice. How true do you think that is in, in this case? Um, uh, well, I mean, nobody will ever know except OJ, mm. right? And obviously the, the victims would have known, but we can't ask them. But, um, you know, I mean, there's talk around um, the trial that uh, was subsequent to that where he committed an armed robbery to get back some medals that he had uh, lent to a friend. And it does show a, a pattern of behavior which you know, obviously, it's not enough to to um, to have. They didn't have enough evidence, I would assume, to have uh, convicted him. But uh, you know, and, and then he wrote a book called "If I Did It," um, where the word <clears throat> "if" was very, very small type on the front of the book. So people assumed from that, oh, you know, he's definitely guilty. Um, but in insofar as celebrity men being um, not held accountable for their treatment of women, um, it is. It's true that uh, that happens in America, in particular, in, and we've seen lots of instances of that, particularly in the Me Too movement. Um, but as you said, there's issues of race, of uh, celebrity, of uh, male, female kind of, you know, uh, sex <clears throat> wars, and and mm. uh, it, it was for that reason such a sensational textbook to, uh, case um, that captured everyone's imagination. I mean, it's interesting, though, isn't it? I mean, obviously and understandably, Nicole Brown Simpson and Ron Goldman's families didn't feel like they, they got justice. I mean, even with the yes. civil the civil suit, it still isn't justice in the same sure. way. However, his life was destroyed after this, wasn't it? Well, uh, if you ask, if you look at where he was at before, certainly, I mean, the contrast, he was kind of uh, the male version of America's Sweetheart. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously, he was in the Naked Gun movie. He was in a lot of commercials um, that people would have remembered growing up. And he was a very, very wholesome uh, figure. So after that, of course, his reputation was going to be damaged. Um, but he didn't help himself by committing the armed robbery. And in fact, as you pointed out, there was a wrongful death claim, which resulted in a judgment of uh, was $33.5 million. And of that, he has only paid 130000 Really? Correct. So one wonders, uh, when he got out of prison, because he only served half of his sentence, he was paroled after nine years um, for the armed robbery, where all the money, you know, if he didn't pay it, where did all his money go? Um, he would have had a pension from the NFL years. He would have had the money from his book sales. Um, and, uh, you know, maybe he bought property in certain states where um, you can, the house uh, doesn't get taken by creditors. Um, but now the families of um, Nicole Brown and uh, Mr. Goldman's family, they have to go after the estate. Um, and, you know, he, they'll have to file suits in multiple states in California, Nevada mm -hmm. and Florida to try and recover the judgment. Um, he's passed away. You can't, you can't libel the dead. Can we say he did it? Uh, on, on balance of probability now? I mean, you can, but uh, his family could come after you. Uh, you know, I mean, no, you can't level the dead, that's true, but there are still uh, rights. Uh, and as the family have uh, posted on Twitter, on their Twitter account, they've said, you know, please respect our privacy. And it actually is, it is a bit, it feels quite um, kind of low base thing to do, to, to, to say now and go after the family. Mm -hmm. I think that, you know, the, the judgment for the wrongful death suit uh, that will have to be that will have to be recovered, and it will be the family that will pay in the end because the probate process will have to consider all the the claims 
um, of the victims' families. Yeah. Okay, Carol Kilgore, really good to see you this morning. Thank, Thank you very much for your time. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> whatever he did, it's not his family's fault. No. Um, <clears throat> there you go. It's fascinating to look back at all of that, though. Oh, it really is, yeah. And it's a whole new generation of people now who've, who've never heard of O.J. Simpson who are now just starting to look back at that case. And it's, do you know, it's a bit like... I mean, it is tragic, but it's, it's, it's like um, Oscar Pistorius, isn't it? These people who <clears throat> are flying so high, and it was even bigger for O.J. I mean, he was America's sweetheart and a real role model for the black community in America. Mm. And then to be, to be brought down like that... I mean, it was such a shock. Mm. It was like your, your biggest idol. Massive fall from grace. Yeah. Um, but it's a bit like Oscar Pistorius. And mm. now, what will he ever be remembered for? Well, you know, it's... one thing, one mm. thing only. Do get in touch with your views on that one. www.gbnews.com slash your say. Oh, you've got it there. Someone says you've, <clears throat> you've got cue cards. Um, oh, see, I needed it. <laughs> uh, I'm just looking at all these various... There are so, uh, so many, many messages, messages coming through. You can't keep up with them, can you? It's oh, An Anton said with the O.J. Simpson trial, it looked to me like the glove did fit. Yeah, I was always quite confused by that myself. I mean, to me, that looks like a nice snug fit. But well, apparently, no. Apparently, in, in the courtroom, he really struggled to, to put, it, put yeah. it on. I mean, have, have we got the footage of that? Here we go, yeah. Oh, yeah. You can really see him struggling. But I did see some comments on got... X this morning. He has got... a. a that plastic glove on underneath, isn't it? The latex glove. Yeah. Which might have made it a bit more difficult. I mean, I don't think it was... A, it, it, it's not like it was miles out, in a yeah, way. Yeah, no. But... It's that famous line, isn't it? If the glove don't fit, you must acquit. Mm. From his defence attorney. Um, away from that and on to Nike. Mm. Because... Uh, um, is it a Paralympian? Paralympians so ask for one, one single shoe. trainer. Why can't you buy one shoe? A uh, few people getting in touch on this one. Lynn Peachy says, I often wished I could buy single shoes. So I have one foot a size different to the other. That is a really good point. I think I lots of people know. have that. Is it quite common? My mum does. Oh, does she? Half a size out. So what does she have to do? Put a little insole in. Oh. Mm. Very odd. And someone else got in touch with me. I've lost it on the system. <laughs> so um, many. So many. Uh, but saying hey, he's deaf in one ear. Yeah. Um, but he always has to buy two Airpods. headphones. Yeah. Oh yeah. What a waste of money. Be onto something here, though. Single use, single, well, single. Yeah. Single like earbuds or something. Yeah, one glove. I don't. It's the manufacturing process. It would become less efficient, wouldn't it? But, yeah. I don't know. But in this world of diversity and inclusion, maybe we need to start thinking about things like that. <laughs> Buying singular it gloves. Must, might not go down well with Shoes? some of you. You Let go. us know what you think. Anyway, let's see what the weather's going to do. Oh, on the weather, someone oh. said it's not going to be the hottest April ever. Oh. This is Chris Jones. Okay. Uh, the Met Office itself states that it was 29 degrees on April the 16th, 1949. So uh, getting to 20 oh. degrees tomorrow wouldn't be a record breaker. Chris. So there you go, Chris. I'll bow, I'll bow to your knowledge on that one. Yeah. And you've beaten the star. But anyway, let's see what the weather is going to do for you today with Alex. Looks like things are heating up. Boxed boilers. Sponsors of weather on GB News. Morning. Here's your latest GB News weather update brought to you by the Met Office. A bit of a north-south split as we go through today and into the weekend. Some dry, fine weather towards the south, wetter further north. This morning there are heavy outbreaks of rain pushing across parts of Northern Ireland into Northern England and across the bulk of Scotland, though northeastern parts clinging on to some sunshine into the afternoon. Do watch out for some strong gusty winds in the northwest. Across the bulk of England and Wales, lots of fine and at times sunny weather into this afternoon and temperatures rising to highs of around 20, 21, possibly even 22 Celsius towards the southeast. Everywhere, temperatures will be well above average for the time of year. Sticking with the north-south split as we go through the end of the day and into tomorrow, further rain across northern parts, particularly across the borders area, likely to see some heavy bursts for a time and showers feeding in from the northwest. Staying drier towards the south and there will be some clear skies, but quite a bit of cloud and we have mild air across us, so temperatures not dropping a huge amount for most places. 
Through Saturday itself then, a bit of cloud bringing some drizzly rain across northern and western parts of England and Wales perhaps. Towards the southeast though, lots of fine and at times sunny weather again. The more unsettled picture will be once more across parts of Scotland and Northern Ireland. Here some hefty showery rain pushing its way through and temperatures for many will be down a touch compared to today. As we go into Sunday and we're going to see further showers which could be heavy at times across northern areas, drier towards the south but temperatures dropping compared to recent. A brighter outlook with Bob Solar, sponsors of weather on GB News. Now, big congratulations are in order to Victoria from yeah. Hertfordshire, <laughs> who you are very yeah. jealous of this she morning. She is, but I'll tell you what she's won. A she's pizza She's won oven. a pizza oven, which is the best thing going. She's won a pizza oven, Victoria. I'm just so jealous. Anyway, we called her yesterday to let her know about the pizza oven and some other things as well. This is what she said. So, Victoria, I've got some really good news for you. You're the winner of the Great British Giveaway. Oh, my God, are you joking? You've won £12,345. Yeah. You've won £500 to spend in the store of your choice. Oh, my God. You've won a pizza oven, a games console, and you've also won a smart speaker. Oh, my God. This is amazing. What, what do you think you might spend the money on? Oh, we're going to Disney. It's not paid for yet. So this will pay for it. Thank you. You're welcome, Victoria. Um, if you want to be a winner, you could be. We've got our biggest prize of the year so far just available for you. Yes, your chance to win £10,000 in cash, luxury travel items and a 2025 Greek cruise worth £10,000, which adds up to... £20,000. <laughs> It's not exactly Carol Vorderman style maths, that one. But anyway, it could be yours. Here's how. Variety Cruises have been sailing since 1942, and thanks to them, you could set sail in 2025. You have the chance to win a seven-night small boat cruise for two worth £10,000. With your flights, meals, drinks and excursions included, you can choose from any one of their 2025 Greek adventures and find your home at sea. You'll also win an incredible £10,000 in tax-free cash that you can use to make this summer spectacular. We'll also treat you to these luxury travel gifts. For another chance to win a prize worth over £20,000, text WIN to 63232. Text cost £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB04, PO Box 8690, Derby DE19T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5pm on the 26th of April. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash WIN. Please check the closing time if listening or watching on demand. Good luck. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels. We're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Glory DiPiero, bringing you PMQ's live here on GB News. Whenever Parliament is in session on a Wednesday at midday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's questions. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister. And we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. I'm Michelle Jubry, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially 
yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11am on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. In the GB Newsroom, we bring you the news as it happens. With our team of dedicated journalists across the UK, GB News brings you accurate reporting of the day's topical agenda. When the news breaks, wherever and whenever it's happening, we'll be there. This is GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Seven twenty nine. Good morning. Now, if you brave the waves down on I don't know the Devonshire coast or something, those giant beach breakers. Well, no. Well, neither I have I. No. no, I wouldn't be brave enough, quite frankly. No. Uh, but our next guest has gone one better. Laura Crane has become the first British woman to surf the sixty foot waves off Nazaire in Portugal. Yeah, it's been quite the journey to get here because she came on a surfboard. <laughs> she in the studio. Good morning. Good morning. I have morning. to say, frankly, it looks terrifying. Is it a thrill? It is the biggest thrill ever, that's for sure. Yeah, definitely. <laughs> How long have you been surfing for? I've been surfing since I was eight years old. We moved from Bristol to North Devon, actually, so you're oh. right. Devon is wild. Oh. It makes crazy things happen. But, um, yeah, so since I was nine, so 20 years. Wow. What, what, what drives you to all of this and what, what drove you to, to really want to sort of, I guess, take on this challenge and, and do something as quite as crazy as, as tackling a 60 <laughs> uh, I've been, as I said, I've been surfing since I was nine years old, so it's kind of been just my passion since I mm. ever got on a board. And in time, it's kind of just evolved, I suppose. I did competitive surfing, the sort of surfing that's now in the Olympics as of last year. And that was great. I had an incredible career surfing with some brands and, and support that I could have only really dreamed of. And then I had a few years out. I retired. I really struggled with my mental health. I'd been um, a competitive athlete since the age of 12. So at, um, at around 20, 22, I, I took a little little break for just some kind of mental health and, and health things. And yeah. That's interesting, though, the, the idea that you know, when you, you're doing something that presumably you loved even from that early age, but it, it takes that sort of toll on you. Yeah, definitely. I think, I mean, surfing in the UK is not exactly a career path that's particularly uh, favoured. And I think I had to move away super young. When I was 15, I was already kind of travelling the world and not really around my family that much. And it was also a time where women's sport wasn't you know, really valued for actual the athletes in itself. So we were very, like a lot of our value was put in our image and, and how we looked rather than yeah. what we were doing. So that had a real hit. Well, on that note, really interesting that you were actually on Love Island, weren't you, in 2018. What was that like for you as an accomplished athlete, as mm -hmm. someone who already had a career going on to a show that is all about body image? It was really important for me to be who Laura needed to see when I was 15 on there and to show that being strong is cool and it's beautiful as well and mm. I'm not super glam, I'm not great at doing my hair and makeup and I think that was really important for me personally to show on that stage because, yeah, I just I felt like there was not much representation for that when I was younger and it was really important for me to be that person. I don't really know <laughs> if, it, um, if it, it got relayed that way. I came out and I had lots of things in the media about how I was, hadn't had my nails done and oh. all of these other things, so I'm not sure if it uh, quite works, but maybe a 60-foot wave will do it. <laughs> I quite like the fact that you've... I mean, looking at some of, some of the, the notes that you sent through, the, the idea that you talk about... You've done your 60-foot wave, but people have their own 60-foot waves to deal with, their own challenges in life. Yeah, definitely. I think it's so easy to, when you're, a, I guess, young 
kid or whatever to have this passion that you know that you just want to follow. It might be an astronaut or a big wave surfer, whatever it is. And I think it's so important not to lose sight of that and to, to realise the thing that you really were passionate about before society or whatever told you that you shouldn't be. And I definitely got it hammered out of me that I could achieve this and that it wasn't possible for a female, especially from the UK, to do these things. So for me, it's this message is so much bigger than just me surfing a 60-foot wave. It's for everyone to kind of, yeah, believe that you can do the things that you think you can. Laura, we are almost out of time, but you've already conquered your 60-foot your wave. What's next for you? Bigger. Oh? <laughs> yeah. yeah, that is, uh, sadly, the adrenaline rush of this is just too much to, to leave where it is. So, yeah, we're, we're going addictive. bigger. We're pushing for the record and, yeah, that's it. Next season, we're, we're coming back. Oh, oh well, best of luck. <laughs> Thank oh, you very much. I was going to say all power to your elbow, but probably to your knees. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Laura, <laughs> great to see you. Thank, Thank you, you very, very much. much Thanks, indeed. Laura. Now, should you name and shame your ex for bad behaviour online? We're going to be debating that next. The latest GB News Travel. Good morning, I'm Russell Holding. On the M18 North Lanarkshire, the westbound exit at Junction 6 at Newhouse is partly blocked by a breakdown causing delays. In London Londonderry, the A515 is closed each way over the Foyle Bridge for emergency repairs. On the M6 in Cumbria, there's a lane closed northbound along with the entry slip road at Junction 39 at Shap because of an accident causing delays. In the West Midlands, New Street in Dudley is closed for an investigation. On the M1 in Leicestershire, there are northbound queues after traffic was stopped because of an accident between Junctions 20 and 21 from Lutterworth to the M69 at Leicester. In Powys, the A4067 remains closed each way at Astra Gunless because of a landslip. On the M25 in Surrey, the inside lanes closed clockwise with someone's broken down between junctions 11 and 12 from Chertsey to the M3. And in Hampshire, Winchester Hill is closed past Romsey Hospital after an accident. And that's the latest. You can stay up to date throughout the day by visiting our website, gbnews.com. Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com. Keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise and who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria Di Piero, bringing you... PMQ's Live here on GB News. Whenever Parliament is in session on a Wednesday at midday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's questions. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister, and we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's Live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. Welcome back to Breakfast. Now, men have hit out at a women's Facebook page which exposes red flags about ex-partners. Yes, uh, anonymous female members have been warned they could still be unmasked and sued if their posts make false and damaging allegations. So today we are asking, should women name and shame their exes online? Let's talk to lifestyle content creator Kerry Welpdale and marketing expert Polly, 
Polly Arrowsmith. Good to see you both this morning. Kerry, what do you make of this? Because from what I understand, you have to sign up and say that you're not going to say anything derogatory, you're not going to criticise women who've been out with these particular fellas. It's all about safeguarding women and nothing else. I think if someone has done something bad, everyone should look out for one another. And I think it's good for people to highlight... Uh, to be honest with you, this story makes me think of a Tinder swindler straight away. And I would never, ever want to date anybody who has any red flags. So if there are sites out there that highlight people that do have red flags, I think it's a good thing. OK, Polly, what do you think? Yes, I mean, I, I tend to think you have to do the red flags at times. I had a, from my very personal perspective, my ex-partner developed, developed psychosis and put a lot of false information out about me personally that was damaging my own reputation and my business's reputation. And I felt I had to fight back. Mm, I mean, it's, well, what about the, the fellas involved in this? What if they would say, uh, Polly, well, I haven't, I haven't done anything wrong here. Why am I being named and shamed? I think it depends on personal circumstances, you know, for, for me, I, I think I felt I had to do it to protect others and to raise awareness. Um, and, and yes, are some women going to be vindictive about it? Yeah, of, of course. But you're always going to get somebody going to say something that's nasty, unfounded, and so forth. Mm. So I think it's, it's, it's on a case-by-case -case basis. Kerry, what do you think about the idea that there are two sides to every story and women could write whatever they wanted to write online about an ex-partner, uh, but it doesn't actually allow them a defence. It doesn't allow that man to, to give his side, his version of I events. Think, I don't think this should just be about women bringing up red flags. I think if, if women do the same, then men should be allowed to have sites exactly the same to highlight, you know, if, if women do something wrong. I think everyone has the same equal rights here. So it's not a really about a men against or a woman against men. Mm -hmm. I think it's just in general red flags about people should be highlighted. I definitely think that these sites can um, go the wrong way and they can say derogatory things about people which are unfair. Um, and that's, I guess, when other people need to work that out themselves. If they decide to date this person that they've seen red flags or or heard red flags about, that's when they need to make their own decision. But I don't think it can be just women making these sites about men. I think it should be an equal ground and everyone should have their say. Well, that sounds fair enough. Look, sadly, ladies, we've got to leave it there because we're tight for time this morning. But Kerry, Polly, thank you both very much indeed. I sort of think, I'm not, I'm not against it. No, neither am I. No, the only thing I'd worry about is legally, if you say something libelous. Could, oh, you, well, could you be sued? Well, yes. If someone caught wind of that, probably yeah, could. I think you've got to... The, my, understa got to be my understanding is you're not actually allowed to... You can show a picture of them. You're not meant to use their full name or anything like that mm. on them. So it's not meant to be sort of naming and shaming in that sense. It's just all done just on visually. Well, let us know what you think about that. You'll have a view. gbnews.com yeah. slash your say. Yeah, but say, men should have a site that can do the same thing. There you go. Yeah. You can set one up on Facebook if you want. Why That's not? fair, yeah. All right, coming up, we're going to talk to the Shadow Defence Minister, Luke Pollard, about Labour's plans for defence spending. That's next. Patrick Christie's Tonight, weekdays from 9pm. I'm delighted to welcome Andrew Doyle, who was behind that comedy event in Edinburgh last night. Andrew, great stuff. Look, what's the mood like on the ground in Scotland? Well, I mean, certainly at last night's event at Comedy Unleashed in Edinburgh, there was a sense of relief that we're all gathering and we're all laughing at this stuff. We're just laughing at the way that the police have approached this, the way the SNP have approached it. Uh, various people from various of the protected characteristics that you must not uh, mock or offend were mocking each other. It was just a reminder that actually these are just jokes. We're just having a laugh. We're just exercising our uh, creative freedom and our freedom of speech. The mood, I think, is generally uh, one of disbelief that, that, mm. that Hamza Youssef and the SNB have pushed through uh, this crazy authoritarian draconian law, irrespective of all the criticisms that, that have come from senior members of the police, uh, members of the judiciary, uh, members of the public, uh, the, the QCs, various, various bodies have all said this is not workable because the police have said that they will investigate absolutely every complaint. And yeah. although they've said they won't target comedians, 
they're going to end up investigating comedians if the complaints come in because that's what they've pledged to do. Well, that's it. So, conceivably, and this is how ridiculous and unenforceable it is, if someone had reported you last night in that audience, the police would have had to have investigated you, wouldn't they? Yeah, that's absolutely right. And uh, whether they would have taken it any, any further will come down to the individual police officer. We, we had uh, Siobhan Brown from the SNP on the BBC the other day, and she was asked very clearly about this. You know, who makes the decision what to investigate and what not to investigate, how to take it forward? She said it's a matter of individual police judgment. Now, the problem with that, of course, is there are activists within the police force in Scotland. We've caught them at it before. Now, the fact that they're not going to pursue J.K. Rowling after she challenged them uh, is partly probably just cowardice because she's got mm. a lot of power and clout behind her. But if it, if it was a complaint about us, a bunch of yeah. comedians in a small room in Edinburgh, they might well have taken it further. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels, we're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Patrick Christie's. Every weeknight from nine, I bring you two hours of unmissable, explosive debate and headline-grabbing interviews. What impact has that had? We got death threats and the bomb threats on. Our job is to do what's in the best interest of our country. You made well, my I'm argument so... for me. My guest and I tackle the issues that really matter with a sharp take on every story. I'm hearing it up and down the country. That was a beginning, not an end. Patrick Christie's tonight from 9 p.m. only on GB News, Britain's news channel. Seven forty-five. All right, let's get a bit of politics for you this morning and talk to the Shadow Defence Minister Luke Pollard, who joins us now. Great to see you this morning. Tell us more about Labour's defence plans because it's all a bit of a shocker, isn't it? Two point five percent looking at uh, of GDP, looking at defence spending, um, looking at increasing the nuclear deterrent, more building at the shipyard in Barrow and Furness. I mean, it's such a shift from what we were seeing only five years ago. Well, Keir has changed the Labour Party and he is determined that Labour goes into the next general election trusted on defence, which perhaps we might not have been in the past. And that is why Keir is in Barrow today, uh, making clear Labour's commitment to our nuclear deterrent to build the four new dreadnought nuclear submarines that we need to have to maintain that deterrent in Barrow, supporting UK jobs and the UK supply chain, and making clear that when... Uh, economic conditions allow. We hope to get to 2.5% of GDP on defence, making sure that we can support those men and women in our armed forces, have the equipment and the capabilities that they need to deter aggression, but if necessary, defeat an opponent in war. And that is what Keir is setting out today, a strong position on defence. Well, Defence Secretary Grant Shapps says that Sir Keir Starmer is the same man that tried twice to put Jeremy Corbyn in charge of the nation's armed forces. He says this is the same man who wanted to scrap our nuclear deterrent, dismantle NATO and question the integrity of British intelligence community. So can the British public trust the Labour Party with defence or is Sir Keir Starmer just saying anything that he needs to in order to get into number 10? No, Keir has changed the Labour Party. He's made it very clear that the Labour Party that we have in 2024 is very different from the one that went to the polls in 2019. We've set out clearly a commitment, an absolute commitment to the nuclear deterrent, an unshakable commitment to NATO, and an ambition to get to 2.5% of GDP on defence. Now, we've seen from the government that they're cutting defence spending. In the last budget, only a few weeks ago, they actually cut the day-to-day -day spending of defence. And so when Ben Wallace, the former Tory defence secretary, got to his feet in the House of Commons about a year ago and said that defence had been hollowed out and underfunded under the Conservative government, he was right. The thing is, the world is a more contested and difficult place than it has been for a very long time. And that's why we need to make sure that the armed forces have the resources they need to keep the UK and our allies safe. That's why a commitment to the continual at sea deterrent, those nuclear submarines always at sea, able to defend the UK and our allies is so important. But it's also why we're setting out that defence spending should be directed at UK companies first before we look at buying from international companies. 
companies. That's supporting jobs in the UK supply chain uh, right across the United Kingdom, making sure that it's not just those people in uniform that get the benefit of that policy, but it's the entire supply chain across the country as well. Um, look, a, a lot of people would cheer you on. Um, I can hear the people of Barrow cheering you on pretty much. I mean, that's where I'm from, so I know the shipyard very, very well there. Um, and yet there will be people who say, great, but you're sounding more Tory than the Tories. Well, it's important that we get the investment into Barrow because if they are to build more submarines, we need to have more investment in Barrow. And that means more investment in skills as well as the non-defence investment around housing, transport and skills as well. But when it comes to defence, it is important that people, when they vote, can have confidence that a future Labour government would not only be strong on the economy, and Rachel Reeves has set out why economic stability matters so much, but also on national security as well. These are difficult times we are in at the moment. We can see with Russian aggression rising, threats to not only our allies, our NATO allies in Eastern Europe, but also threats to the UK, as well as a hot war in Ukraine that we must continue to support our Ukrainian friends until they win. We need to make sure that the electorate knows that their uh, national security will be safe with a Labour government and that we have a policy to uh, deal with the capability gaps and the hollowing out that we've seen under the Conservatives on over the last 14 years. I mean, the army is the smallest level it's been since the Napoleonic eras. We've lost 200 aircraft from the RAS and one in five Royal Navy ships have been scrapped. That's not a record to be proud of. But importantly, it's not the record that we need to keep the UK and our allies safe in these more difficult times. And that's why Keir is in Barrow today, setting out clearly our policy of investing in the skills, the workforce in Barrow to build the new nuclear submarines that we need and to make sure that when economic conditions allow, we're able to increase defence spending to 2.5%, making sure that we can replace those lost capabilities and have a strong uh, uh, armed forces set up to support the UK and support our allies abroad as well. OK. Luke Pollard, good to talk to you this morning. Can I just say I'm impressed that, you, that people have been saying Barrow in Furness and not Barrow in Furness, which is totally <laughs> wrong. Um, make sure Keir gets it right today, otherwise he's <laughs> going to be in a whole heap <laughs> of trouble when he's up there. Uh, thanks for talking to us today. Thank you very Thank much. You. Well, Claire Pistol and Nigel Nelson are with us. Very good morning to Hello. you both. What do you make of that and Labour's plan for defence? It's quite interesting. What a turnaround mm. five well, years ago. It is a big ago. turnaround, yeah. Yeah, five years ago you had Corbyn really anti-nuclear deterrent, wanted to get rid of Trident, and then we went sort of through the Ed Miliband who wanted sort of minimal deterrent and a little bit less of it all, and really gone full Tory, as, mm. as you said. Um, quite interesting that it, there hasn't been a Labour leader in the nuclear yard at Barrow and Furnace for at least 30, 30 years. years. Wow. Um, uh, Karen Delph, Delphi says uh, the, the new dreadnought class is already being built in Barrow. Labour are not promising anything new. The four new subs are already part of the UK-Australia contract. That, that, well, that's true. I mean, the, the, what is, what, the situation at the moment is that we've got our um, Vanguard submarines, which carry the Trident missiles. Um, they're being replaced by these new dreadnoughts, and those are the ones that Keir's going up to sea and a sea built in Barrow. The, the, the point, the most significant thing about this is the commitment to Trident. Trident's phenomenally expensive. It probably will cost um, 200... Uh, uh, 200 billion pounds, so much more than the health service costs. But it's a question of whether or not we go for conventional uh, forces. Ukraine has, uh, has opened the possibility uh, of a land war in Europe, so conventional forces will be needed, but we can't do both. Mm. What, what Luke Pollard just signalled there, and I think obviously Keir Starmer's trip to Barrow uh, reinforces it, is we think that Britain's defence is best served by having submarines. Mm -hmm. They can pop out of nowhere without anyone seeing them and fire their nuclear missiles should we ever need to. Yeah. 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 What, what, what about... Um, and we've had quite a few, like Anita, getting in touch this morning, saying that Labour MP is not telling the truth. He slipped up by saying, you know, they'll, they'll go to 2.5 per cent of GDP when economically viable. In other words, they're not going to do it. And I think that's the problem. It's all very well to say that you, you want to build all these things, you want to spend all the money, but they know full well that the economic uh, progress of the country is slow. 
uh, to spend 2.5%, which we absolutely should have been doing anyway. Mm. And I think Ben Wallace, the former Defence Secretary, was quite plain on that. Mm. But I think Labour are backing themselves into a corner. They're, they're going out there, they're looking at the shiny new subs, they're saying how marvellous it all is and they really want uh, the UK defence industry to be up and running, but there isn't the money to do it. So where's it coming from? So aren't they being economically uh, so sensible then? Yes, but also economical with the truth as to how much they're actually going to push forward because, as you've already said, the, the dreadnought class is already being built. The AUKUS deal was part of a, a Boris Johnson um, pr uh, premiership. Yeah. So all of that is in place. So what is it that he is going to invest in and how much money and where is that money going to come from? And that's unfortunately the problem with Labour is that you never get where the money is coming from. You never get these costed plans. Well, the, the whole point about getting to the 2.5%, uh, especially if Trump becomes president later on this year, is we need that for our NATO commitment. Now, it's absolutely right to say, you know, what, um, uh, when the, the, the finance, financial situation allows, if necessary, you could borrow the money. I mean, the trouble is, what, what your lot will do is say, oh, well, they'll put up taxes and stuff like that. And Which is uh, there's exactly no re what they're the likely to do. Well, it, well, it, it isn't. <laughs> yes, it because is. if you need to borrow to invest, you might borrow that, borrow that money if needed, or they find that extra half a billion pounds. And we're at the moment at 2%, they find that extra half a billion pounds from somewhere else. Mm. Right, so it's going to be another spending thing that they're going to back out on because I think we've seen this, haven't we? So the windfall tax was going to pay for lots of different things four times over. Uh, the VAT on private schools, that's also going to pay for an awful lot of things. And then you've got the non-DOM status tax loophole, which we did, and you kind of think, where's the money coming from? You can't tell us. All okay, costed. Well, <laughs> well, all costed. He said, well, let us know what you think, GB Views. It, no, no, gbnews.com slash your say. Yes. Nigel and Claire, thank you very much. Let's take a look at the weather now for you. That warm feeling inside from Boxed Boilers. Sponsors of weather on GB News. Morning. Here's your latest GB News weather update brought to you by the Met Office. A bit of a north-south split as we go through today and into the weekend. Some dry, fine weather towards the south, wetter further north. This morning there are heavy outbreaks of rain pushing across parts of Northern Ireland into Northern England and across the bulk of Scotland, though northeastern parts clinging on to some sunshine into the afternoon. Do watch out for some strong gusty winds in the northwest. Across the bulk of England and Wales, lots of fine and at times sunny weather into this afternoon and temperatures is rising to highs of around 20, 21, possibly even 22 Celsius towards the southeast. Everywhere, temperatures will be well above average for the time of year. Sticking with the north-south split as we go through the end of the day and into tomorrow, further rain across northern parts, particularly across the borders area, likely to see some heavy bursts for a time and showers feeding in from the northwest. Staying drier towards the south and there will be some clear skies, but quite a bit of cloud and we have mild air across us, so temperatures not dropping a huge amount for most places. Through Saturday itself then, a bit of cloud bringing some drizzly rain across northern and western parts of England and Wales perhaps. Towards the southeast though, lots of fine and at times sunny weather again. The more unsettled picture will be once more across parts of Scotland and Northern Ireland. Here some hefty showery rain pushing its way through and temperatures for many will be down a touch compared to today. As we go into Sunday and we're going to see further showers which could be heavy at times across northern areas, drier towards the south but temperatures dropping compared to recent. A brighter outlook with Box Solar, sponsors of weather on GB News. The latest GB News travel. Good morning, I'm Russell Holding on the M6 in Cumbria. The northbound exit at Junction 42 for the A6 south of Carlisle is closed after a vehicle caught fire. And there's also a lane closed northbound along with the entry slip road at Junction 39 at Shap after an accident. On the M6 on Merseyside, there's a lane closed southbound after an accident between Junctions 23 and 22 from Haydock to Newton the Willows causing queues. In the West Midlands, New Street in Dudley is closed for an investigation. Tower Street also closed there. The M1 
one in Leicestershire is blocked northbound by an accident between junctions 20 and 21 from Lutterworth to the M69 at Leicester, causing long delays. And on the M25 in Surrey, the inside lanes closed partwise where someone's broken down between junctions 11 and 12 from Chertsey to the M3, causing delays. And that's the latest. You can stay up to date throughout the day by visiting our website, gbnews.com. This is your chance to win our biggest prize of the year so far. First, there's a totally tax-free £10,000 in cash for you to spend this summer. Then, we want to send you on a bespoke seven-night small boat cruise for two worth £10,000. Thanks to Variety Cruises, you'll be able to choose from any of their 2025 Greek adventures and discover Greece like never before. And with flights, meals, drinks and excursions included, all you have to do is relax. We'll also give you these terrific travel trips for another chance to win a prize worth over £20,000, text PRIZE to 63232. Text costs £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB04 PO Box 8690 Derby DE1 9 T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5pm on the 26th of April. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if listening or watching on demand. Good luck. 2024, a battleground year. The year the nation decides. As the parties gear up their campaigns for the next general election. Who will be left standing when the British people make one of the biggest decisions of their lives? Who will rise? And who will fall? Let's find out together. For every moment, the highs, the lows, the twists and turns. We'll be with you for every step of this journey. In 2024, GB News is Britain's election channel. I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Gloria De Piero, bringing you PMQ's live here on GB News. Whenever Parliament is in session on a Wednesday at midday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's questions. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister. And we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. Good morning to you. It's 8 o'clock on Friday the 12th of April. Today, Sir Keir Starmer pledges to boost military spending to 2.5% as he claims the country's nuclear deterrent is safe in his hands. We've set out clearly a commitment, an absolute commitment to the nuclear deterrent, an unshakable commitment to NATO and an ambition to get to 2.5% of GDP on defence. Yes, Keir Starmer is trying to paint the Labour Party as the party of defence, but can he afford to put his money where his mouth is? Find out more with me very soon. Controversial NFL star OJ Simpson, who was cleared of murdering his ex-wife and her friend in a criminal trial, dies at the age of 76 following a battle with cancer. People in Portland furious over what they deem to be a luxury-free bus service to ferry asylum seekers around. Yeah. And in the last hour, the latest GDP numbers showed that the economy grew by 0.1% in February. That's according to the Office for National Statistics, meaning that the UK has dodged recession. The news presenter Rachel Burden has said that having a baby at 41 was really selfish. We'll debate that later on. Good morning. England captain Harry Kane says his three children are fine after they were involved in a three-car crash in Germany earlier this week. We look back on a thrilling night of Europa League action and in golf we'll have updates from the Masters. Some warm sunshine across southern parts as we head into the weekend, but a wetter story further north. I'll have more in the full forecast shortly. Morning to you. I'm Stephen Dixon. And I'm Ellie Costello and this is Breakfast on GB News. Loads of you getting in touch on the new forum mm. this morning, gbnews.com slash your say, including David Johnson. Morning, David. We were talking about pensions in the papers a little bit earlier on. Um, and this idea of the triple lock... It's not, it wasn't about getting rid of the triple lock. The papers are saying some people are being failed by the triple lock, different types of pensions and what have you. Mm. Um, and David says the triple lock... Um, 
Not everyone has a private pension, Stephen. Millions of us only get the basic state pension, which is one of the lowest in Europe. So the triple lock boosts this small amount. Because I, I, I wasn't saying, David, that everyone has a private pension. What I was responding to was someone getting in touch saying, well, what, it's not fair. We should have the triple lock because civil servants and MPs and things have golden-plated pensions, pointing out that they're private pensions and not the state pension. Um, and it must be incredibly difficult if you've only got the state pension, mm. actually. Of course, moving forward... The issue is that moving forward, the state pension isn't going to exist. It's, it's not. In, in, I don't know how long, but it'll be got rid of at some point. And that's partly why everyone has to have a workplace pension now. Mm. It's all sort of set up, isn't it? When you start a new job, you put on a workplace pension. I suppose you can opt out of it if you really wanted to. But most Wouldn't people be very don't. wise if you did. Wouldn't be, because state pension... By the time I retire, I'm not expecting a state pension. Really? Mm. Oh, you think it will happen that quickly? Potentially. No <laughs> Oh, I'm thinking it's going to oh, take. Oh, thanks, darling. No, yeah. no, no, no. But I mean, I thought it was going to take decades and decades and decades. I don't think. As in, gonna... I wasn't even going to see it. I don't think we're going to. I don't think we're, we're going to be able to afford it. And the oh. triple and the triple lock. Um, well, I mean, can we afford the triple lock. I, I, well, you know, I think the triple lock's a good idea. But then you've got to look at the fact: is it what Affordable. is it costing us? Yeah. Um, I'm not. I'm not. I'm not advocating getting rid of it. Don't get me wrong. I'm well, just saying. It's controversial. Saying, whoever comes out with that. I'm just saying when you when you look at the bigger picture which is what politicians have to do, and someone at some, at some point is going to have to say, no, we'll have a double lock, but not a triple lock. Mm, that might um, have to be the way it goes. <clears throat> it would not surprise me if it's... I'm not saying the Labour Party will do it, but I'm saying is when you need a party to get into power with a huge majority who then have the authority to go, we can do this, and we're still probably going to be all right for the next election as well. Yeah, so as the polls suggest, <clears throat> something like that might happen in the next <clears throat> year. Well, Who knows? But it's got the potential, at least. Mm. If they get, a, if Labour get a huge majority, then they've got the potential to do a lot of things which are politically quite, otherwise quite difficult. Mm. Whether whether they will or not, I mean, I'm not saying they will. I'm just saying they have the potential there. But on that note, this is really interesting. We didn't get to to put it to our Labour round a little bit earlier on, but front page of the Guardian this morning is basically warning that Labour could lose key seats over their stance in Gaza and the climate crisis. Apparently, young voters and Muslim voters are feeling really alienated by all of this. So that could be the difference between a <coughs> Parliament and a majority. I don't think it'll be that many. Really? No, but it's interesting because how does the Labour Party appease all sides in all of this? And they can't. It's a difficult basically, job. Because it's people who are frustrated on a single issue. Mm -hmm. um, and so Labour isn't going to acquiesce to that. Yes. I wouldn't have thought. Um, but would it be enough to. The way the figures are looking at the moment, I don't think that would be enough to no. cause a hung parliament. Mm. Maybe a hung parliament's a good idea. Maybe that's what we need. Mm. I'm always a bit uncomfortable. Really really un that's not what they want. I'm uncomfortable with it. I, I don't like hung parliaments. No. Can't get things done, can you? Uh, but anyway, this is the new forum that loads of you are messaging yes. in on. It is gbnews.com slash your say. Oh, now Anne Harvey says, Stephen, stop making people worry about not getting their state pension. Don't you worry, Anne. It's only... He's not in charge. Nothing's going to happen. I'm not in charge. And it's, it will only be people who are nowhere near getting their... nowhere near retirement age yet. Like so, yeah. there you go. Redeeming so, myself, um, digging myself out of that so hole. I'm, not, I'm just, I'm just putting forward a, an, an idea. I mean, they've been talking about it not happening for years. Anyway, enough of that. If you want to get in touch, or oh, dig, when you're in a hole, Stephen, stop digging. Um, if you want to get in touch, this is how you do it. Then you go to gbnews.com/yoursay, and if you want to know more about it, here's a few of the details. We are proud to be GB News, the people's channel. And as you know, we always love to hear your views. Now, there's a new way of getting in touch with us at gbnews.com forward slash your say. By commenting, you can be part of a live conversation and join our GB News community. You can even talk to me, Bev Turner, or any of the members of the GB News family. Simply go to gbnews.com forward slash your say. Yeah, and looking forward to hearing from you this morning. The message is popping through all the time, so it's... Good to have your company. Now, let's uh, have a look at our top story this morning.
Yes, the Labour leader, Sir Keir Starmer, says the UK's nuclear deterrent is the bedrock of his plan to keep Britain safe. Well, that's in very stark contrast to the Jeremy Corbyn era, he, of course, being the champion of nuclear disarmament. Well, meanwhile, Sir Keir Starmer said he would like to boost the defence budget to 2.5% of GDP. A little earlier, we spoke to the shadow defence minister, Luke Pollard. The world is a more contested and difficult place than it has been for a very long time. And that's why we need to make sure that the armed forces have the resources they need to keep the UK and our allies safe. That's why a commitment to the continual at-sea deterrent, those nuclear submarines always at sea, able to defend the UK and our allies, is so important. But it's also why we're setting out that defence spending should be directed at UK companies first before we look at buying from international companies. Well, we're joined now by our political correspondent, Olivia Utley, who is live for us in Westminster. Good to see you, Olivia. And it's really just such a stark contrast, isn't it, to the Corbyn era just five years ago? Well, exactly, Ellie. I mean, it couldn't really be more of a contrast. Jeremy Corbyn advocated uh, in an impassioned way for nuclear disarmament, said that he would get rid of Trident if he were to be Prime Minister. Now Keir Starmer is pitching Labour as the party of defence. He says that Labour would raise defence spending to 2.5%. They would build more submarines. They would continue to keep that uh, all, all year round submarine defence at sea all the time. And he is visiting Barrow and Furness, uh, which which no Labour leader has done for over 30 years. The question for Labour is, can they really afford what they're promising here? Over and over again, John Healy, the shadow defence secretary, has been asked uh, what he would invest in defence, how much of GDP he would spend on defence. And up until now, he's refused to say. He's uh, said that the uh, Tory party has hollowed out our defence forces, but he actually won't, wouldn't have put a figure on it because he said that Labour would need to do a, a study into what was being spent at at the moment would have to do a sort of overhaul, see what was going on before they could commit a figure. Now, Keir Starmer has turned that on his head and is very much committing a figure. But where is he getting that money from? As yet, it doesn't seem to be costed. We will expect to hear more about that over the coming days. But for now, it's not clear at all. Will this be a Labour promise which, a bit further down the line, a bit closer to the election, we end up seeing being watered down a little bit? I think we should all have our eyes on the Labour manifesto to see exactly what happens with that 2.5% promise. Now, Olivia, I've got to ask you, is that sky yeah. behind you real? It is absolutely beautiful. Well... I, I went out at lunch uh, at breakfast time um, because it looks so beautiful, but outside it really doesn't look that beautiful at all. So um, I'm not sure what's going on behind me. We might have a lovely <laughs> filter across it. It's uh, captivating, as are you, Olivia. Thank you very much. <laughs> I don't know what's going on. This <laughs> um, sticking with some slightly political stuff, um, mm. pensions, because I've, I've set the cat amongst the pigeons today. Deborah Betts, hi, Deborah, says, I'm 57. Uh, I've been a stay-at-home carer most of my working life. I have no private pension. I hope I will get my state pension. Don't panic. Stephen's panicking, you all. I totally agree. It will be phased out. I just hope not yet. If 57, no, you'll be fine. You'll be fine. You'll As be fine. will Stephen. I just think they might announce it within the next five to ten years and then it will, it will, it'll be 20 years of phasing it out. So I don't think it'll happen. You know, they're not going to just say, right, we're stopping it. It'll be yeah. a it'll, so you'll be fine. But if you've got a workplace pension, do you put it aside? Yeah. I got a letter through the other day. I haven't got a lot in there. <laughs> I was thinking, ooh, going to have to keep working yeah. Yeah, but for a yeah, long time yeah, ahead. Yeah. Well, it's terrifying. You can, you can add... It's the first time I thought about it, actually. It's when you get the letter saying, oh, you've got what looks like a large pot, and oh, then they say, oh, that pot. will bring you in £19,000 a year on an annuity. And you're like, yeah. what? <laughs> Because you want to have enough to go on your holidays. It's scary. Scary stuff. We're all living longer. It's expensive to live. Mm. Don't we just know it? 
<laughs> right, <clears throat> let's move on to O.J. Simpson, should we? Heck, that's a bit of a name from the past, isn't it? And what a controversial name it has been. He has died at the age of 76 after a battle with cancer. Well, back in 1995, Simpson was acquitted for double murder of his ex-wife and her friend in a sensational case that divided America. Two years later, a civil jury found Simpson liable for wrongful death in that double murder. Well, his family have uh, put a statement out on X saying, Our father, Orental James Simpson, succumbed to his battle with cancer, surrounded by his children and grandchildren. During this time of transition, his family asks that you please respect their privacy and grace. Well, earlier we spoke to US lawyer Carol Kilgore. But he remembers where they were when the verdict um, was read, uh, even people that weren't in the U.S. at the time. And it was, as you said, sensational, um, because a few years earlier was the Rodney King um, <clears throat> beating and there were race riots in L.A. And it does feel like that was kind of the beginnings of all of what we're experiencing now with a lot of the controversy around race in America. I heard that someone make the argument that because the, the Rodney King, the, the, I mean, there was video of this man being attacked by mm -hmm. white police officers, and yet they were acquitted. Yes. Um, I, I, I heard some commentary saying, in a way, that the O.J. Simpson acquittal was people trying to balance the books, okay, if you like. That, that's probably an accurate estimation. Although there were other issues, uh, of course, uh, rather than race around the trial. I mean, there was the whole defence team of uh, um, O.J. Simpson. If you uh, ever watch shows like The Kardashians, mm. you know, you're, you're watching that legacy of um, those very famous lawyers. And it was one of those situations where the actual legal team became as famous as the celebrity um, defendant. Mm. No, that is, is such an interesting take from all of this. I mean, uh, talking about attorneys, Gloria Allred, who's the attorney who represented Nicole Brown Simpson's family uh, during that murder trial, uh, says that this whole case uh, served as a reminder that the justice system failed women and allowed celebrity men to avoid true justice. How true do you think that is in, in this case? Um, uh, well, I mean, nobody will ever know except O.J., mm. right? And obviously the, the victims would have known, but we can't ask them. But, um, you know, I mean, there's talk around um, the trial that uh, was subsequent to that where he committed an armed robbery to get back some medals that he had uh, lent to a friend. And it does show a, a pattern of behaviour which... You know, obviously, it's not enough to to um, to have. They didn't have enough evidence, I would assume, to have uh, convicted him. But uh, you know, and, and then he wrote a book called "If I Did It," um, where the word <laughs> "if" was very, very small type on the front of the book. So people assumed from that, oh, you know, he's definitely guilty. Um, but in insofar as celebrity men being um, not held accountable for their treatment of women, um, it. It is true that uh, that happens in America in particular, in, and we've seen uh, lots of instances of that, particularly in the Me Too movement. Um, but as you said, there's issues of race, of uh, celebrity, of uh, male-female kind of, you know, uh, sex <clears throat> wars, and, and mm. uh, it, it was for that reason such a sensational textbook to, uh, case um, that captured everyone's imagination. I mean, it's interesting, though, isn't it? I mean, obviously and understandably, Nicole Brown Simpson and Ron Goldman's families didn't feel like they, they got justice. I mean, even with the, yes. civil, the civil suit, it still isn't justice in the same sure. way. However, his life was destroyed after this, wasn't it? Well, uh, if you ask, if you look at where he was at before, certainly, I mean, the contrast, he was kind of the male version of America's Sweetheart. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously he was in the Naked Gun movie. He was in a lot of commercials um, that people would have remembered growing up. And he was a very, very wholesome uh, figure. So after that, of course, his reputation was going to be damaged. Um, but he didn't help himself by committing the armed robbery.
Well, it's been just over six months now since the government's controversial barge, the Bibby Stockholm, opened its doors to asylum seekers. Well, since then, tensions amongst locals have been running high. One of the main sources of frustration amongst Portlanders is a luxury free bus service that reportedly ferries asylum seekers around while locals are left out. Uh, well, our southwest of England reporter Jeff Moody went to Portland to find a community just as angry and divided as ever. When the bus comes in Portland, not everyone can get on it. If they travel on the bus with the local community, there could be some sort of integration because a lot of people are confused why they're here and maybe a little chat on the bus because that's where people do talk. Because I meet people on the bus every day and you end up chatting. Wouldn't this be a great way to integrate? But no, they're separated. And how can the local community move forward if they're always kept in isolation from us. For some, there are echoes of segregation and it's leading to resentment. Resentment at the special buses, resentment at the health care the Bibby residents receive, resentment at the wet weather gear for hiking that Dorset Council provides. Six months on from the arrival of the first residents on the Bibby Stockholm, the feeling in the local community is just as strong just as divided and just as passionate as it always has been. And while a community that didn't ask for this argues and accuses, the sheer cost of the Bibby Stockholm sticks in their throat, £34.8 million. If you break that down into figures, that works out at capacity at about £4,500 per month per head. And, I mean, if you do a little bit of investigation, you can rent uh, a really plush house in Sandbanks for that money or an apartment in Chelsea each. Or, you know, you may as well just send them on um, a Caribbean cruise for a month on inclusive because that's what £4,500 a month will get you for your money. They were sold the idea the barge was cheaper on the taxpayers' pocket than asylum hotels. But in an investigation by the National Audit Office into the Home Office's asylum policy, it was revealed not only is this more expensive than hotels, at the time of commissioning the barge, the Home Office had not even estimated costs. They were flying blind. I'm shocked, really. I mean, the Home Office blatantly lied. Um, they told us that the Bibby Stock Home was to offer value for the taxpayer for housing asylum seekers. And we now know from the National Audit Office document that was released at the end of March that it's not just a little bit more expensive, it's exorbitantly more expensive. It, I mean, it, it's obscene, the cost, the money that is being thrown at this barge. In a statement, the Home Office told GB News, we have always been clear that the use of asylum hotels is unacceptable and that's why we acted swiftly to reduce the impact on local communities by moving asylum seekers onto barges and former military sites. While the National Audit Office's figures include set-up costs, it is currently better value for money for the taxpayer to continue with these sites than to use hotels. But the taxpayers in Portland don't feel they're getting value. And they don't feel valued either. And it's starting to be a problem. Jeff Moody, GB News. Well, it's a little bit like salt in the wound, isn't it? Mm. For that, you can understand people's frustration with all of that. Anyway, on a lighter note, uh, Paul Wilkie says, um, are you two the same off camera? Yeah. You both cheer my mornings up. Oh, well, Paul. No, we uh, don't talk when the, anything's on. We actually do. We just, hate we, each other, sit, would you believe? Sit there like that. Like this. Like, no, we are exactly the same. Ironically, it's Bev and Andrew who really like each other. <laughs> and then they just, they just fake it for the... Uh, <laughs> they no, really get on. Yeah, viewers actually really like that, though. They like a they like them bickering sparring. husband and wife. Oh, it's like, this, it's like your worst possible married couple, those two. Yeah. Is that, I don't like bickering but I feel in like, families. No, I don't like it either, it's but I do feel telly. like the two of them do, deep down, really love each other. Do you think? I think so. I like to believe in love. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. But, uh, no, what you see is what you get with us is exactly the Afraid same. Afraid so. Yeah. Afraid so. It's just we've both got slightly posher voices on, because obviously I sound more northern and she's from Essex, so you can imagine what she sounds like yeah. when, she's, when the you microphone's off. <laughs> give, us a, give, give us a bit of Essex. You are right, babes? It's not yeah. quite like that, but, yeah. It's like, the, it's like the only way is Essex. 
Yeah, it is. That is my neck of the woods, yeah. actually. Mm. You just go to school with all of them. Anyway, we are dressed like the sunshine. We are. Are we going to get some sunshine today? Let's ask Alex Burkle. That warm feeling inside from Boxed Boilers. Sponsors of weather on GB News. Morning, here's your latest GB News weather update brought to you by the Met Office. A bit of a north-south split as we go through today and into the weekend. Some dry, fine weather towards the south, wetter further north. This morning there are heavy outbreaks of rain pushing across parts of Northern Ireland into Northern England and across the bulk of Scotland, though northeastern parts clinging on to some sunshine into the afternoon. Do watch out for some strong gusty winds in the northwest. Across the bulk of England and Wales, lots of fine and at times sunny weather into this afternoon and temperatures rising to highs of around 20, 21, possibly even 22 Celsius towards the southeast. Everywhere, temperatures will be well above average for the time of year. Sticking with the north-south split as we go through the end of the day and into tomorrow, further rain across northern parts, particularly across the borders area, likely to see some heavy bursts for a time and showers feeding in from the northwest. Staying drier towards the south and there will be some clear skies, but quite a bit of cloud and we have mild air across us, so temperatures not dropping a huge amount for most places. Through Saturday itself then, a bit of cloud bringing some drizzly rain across northern and western parts of England and Wales perhaps. Towards the southeast though, lots of fine and at times sunny weather again. The more unsettled picture will be once more across parts of Scotland and Northern Ireland. Here some hefty showery rain pushing its way through and temperatures for many will be down a touch compared to today. As we go into Sunday and we're going to see further showers which could be heavy at times across northern areas, drier towards the south but temperatures dropping compared to recent. A brighter outlook with Box Solar, sponsors of weather on GB News. Right, this is what you've been waiting for. Our biggest giveaway of the year so far. You can win £10,000 in cash, some luxury travel items and a Greek cruise on a nice little yacht for next year worth ten grand. Well, it's a prize package worth more than £20,000 and it could all be yours. Here's how you can win. Variety Cruises have been sailing since 1942 and thanks to them, you could set sail in 2025. You have the chance to win a seven-night small boat cruise for two worth £10,000. With your flights, meals, drinks and excursions included, you can choose from any one of their 2025 Greek adventures and find your home at sea. You'll also win an incredible £10,000 in tax-free cash that you can use to make this summer spectacular. We'll also treat you to these luxury travel gifts. For another chance to win a prize worth over £20,000, text WIN to 63232. Text cost £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB04, PO Box 8690, Derby DE1 9 UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5pm on the 26th of April. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash WIN. Please check the closing time if listening or watching on demand. Good luck. Yes, good luck indeed. You've got no pizza oven to be jealous of this time. Not this time. Victoria won that one. She did. Not, that you're, not that you're holding grudges. Morning, Victoria. Get in touch, <laughs> Victoria. Um, let us know when the pizza oven arrives, because I'm coming round. Yeah, we've been pricing up pizza, pizza oven. Pizza, pizza, pizza ovens. ovens. This morning. Um, so I yes, think you should so, get one, really. No, well, no. First of all, she said she would buy me one. <laughs> and then I realised the price. Uh, the £300. And then I said, well, you can't afford to buy one because you're that. saving up for a wedding. So yeah. she said, will you buy me? one for the wedding. But see, you haven't got a garden. Not yet, darling, but maybe in time. We can manifest starting with pizza oven. <laughs> but anyway. Uh, still to come, the broadcaster Rachel Burden has said having a baby at 41 was really selfish. So mm. this morning we're asking the question, is having a baby in your 40s selfish? We're going to be debating that next. Martin Daubney. Weekdays from 3pm. Mark White was saying there, Sue, that he thinks it's getting worse. And you, again, you were nodding along to that. You've, you've seen this over decades. Situation is sprawling along the coast, more people, yes. and the danger is ramping up. Definitely, um, because the, the numbers and the money is... It's run like a military operation. Mm. I mean, I've been told that by the National Crime Agency, and I don't need to be told it by them to know it. It is meticulous because there's so much money involved. 
So they're, they're marshalling migrants here, the gangs, they're controlling the gangs, and there will be a Mr. A Kingpin. Mm. You know, in some city far away in Erbil, or even in Paris, or in Brussels, who never goes anywhere near the beaches. It's like a Ponzi scheme, really. Yeah. With that in mind, um, there's such vested interests, such money, such demand, a never-ending string of demand of people yes. who want to come here. People How are on already Earth? on their way, remember. Yeah. If we stop them now, they're already leaving... There's people leaving the Sudan now are going to reach the only place they want to get to, the French beaches, to get to the UK. They'll arrive in two and a half years' time. And so, you see, they're on their way. If it's that organised, that lucrative, that desirable, how on earth do we ever break that chain? I th um, it sounds incredibly harsh, but I'm sure, I think if the EU uh, change uh, politically in the June elections, which I think it probably will, yes. I think they will put up, as the Greeks have done, holding camps all over Europe, the coasts of Europe, where people are reassessed, assessed, just to see who is coming in, which would be a plus, mm. as the Greeks have done, because we have no idea who is coming in. Are the newspapers getting you down? My wife didn't divorce me that month. <laughs> <laughs> Struggling to separate the wheat from the chaff. I know that it's a bit of a circus at the best of times. <laughs> well, don't worry. Headliners has got you covered. We'll take the burden of reading the day's news, and if we get depressed, who cares? It's an occupational hazard, frankly. That's Headliners on GB News from 11pm till midnight and the following morning, 5 till 6am, on GB News, the comedy channel. Nah, just kidding. Britain's news channel. Join me, Camilla Tomini, every Sunday at 9.30 when I'll be interviewing the key players in British politics and taking them to task. And this report basically says that he's not fit to stand trial. With an upcoming election looming over Westminster, now is the time for clear, honest answers. I agree. And that's precisely what I'll get. Is he indecisive? Incompetent? That's the Camilla Tomini Show at 9.30 every Sunday on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's election channel. Um, just a quickie from Christine Stock, as I said, everyone's waiting for the prize to, you know, work through that shit. I'm not waiting for the prize. I'm waiting for the sports news, please. Well, Aidan will be here very shortly. You're in luck. In we, about ten minutes' time. We couldn't do him last hour because we just had too much to pack in because of our political interview. So, um, but he will be here very, very shortly. He's waiting in the wings, mm. so to speak. Yeah. Uh, now, what do you make of this? You're going to have a view, that's for sure. The broadcaster, Rachel Burden, has said that having a baby at 41 was really selfish and admitted she felt arrogant to assume that it would be free of complications. Uh, well, she's now 49 and a mother of four, and she ended up giving birth to her son prematurely after convincing... Um, her husband, who's also a journalist, it was the right time. So today we're asking that very question. Is it selfish to have kids over the age of 40? Uh, let's talk to journalist Olivia Buxton and child and behavioural expert Amanda Jenner. Good to see you both. Olivia, is it well, selfish? I think as long as you want to have a child, you're prepared to love it and raise it. It's no more selfish than 40 than at any other age. Amanda, what do you make I mean, of it? I think that it's... Uh, I think it is selfish because, um, you know, there's so many milestones that your child will want to hit with you later on in life. And obviously, it, there's, there's loads of factors to this, you know, because I speak to so many people and they say to me, you know, when their parents are older and they haven't even hit their 20s, they're saying, oh, I'm not sure if my mum or my dad will be here when I'm getting married or having my first grandchild. And... And, you know, and that can really affect them and they, they feel they have to rush certain milestones in their lives. So I think, you know, there's swings and roundabouts, but there's definitely a selfish aspect to it. Mm. I mean, I, I suppose the, the, the question, Olivia, with all of this is, should you focus on what you want as a parent or what you want for your child? Well, yeah, I mean, I had my son at the age of 40 and the pregnancy wasn't planned. I'm 51 now and he's three. And I no regrets. He's wonderful. He's siblings, a perspective on life. 
Uh, Olivia, I mean, I Olivia, be... apologies to interrupt. But unfortunately, our, our connection with you is so bad, we can't really hear what you're saying. I'm so, so sorry about that. Um, we'll, we'll try and reflect your view uh, a little bit to Amanda instead. I mean, the, the, I mean, the, the, the issue is, Amanda, why sh in a modern world, why should we be dictating what, what parents can do? Because I think, you know, obviously there's, there's health aspects to this as well. It's not just about, you know, uh, having that career and having, you know, there's a lot of people having them in the mid-40s to 50s. There was someone the other day that had a child at 60. I mean, you know, take my hat off to them because they must have some energy because obviously your energy levels go down, you know, you have more health aspects that happen. And I think that it's just, you really have to really consider this. It's not just about you wanting that child later on in life. It's about, you know, as I say, all those milestones that your child is going to want to share with you. And if you're in your 70s or 80s and you're just, you know, again, people are getting married in their 30s and 40s, are they going to be there? Are they going to witness their children's, you know, their first grandchild and stuff? And I think that, you know, you really have to consider it and for yourself, for your body as well. You know, we, we change. I'm 50 this year and I'm tired. I just, I couldn't imagine having a child at 60. Um, it, it, you know, you're tired and you've got, there's just so many aspects to it. And I think you really have to consider it. It's great having that career and saying, yeah, I'm going to wait until I'm 40 to I have my first baby, but it's very different when it happens. Mm. I mean, there is a lot to consider, Amanda, that's for sure, but there must be benefits as well. You're seeing more and more women becoming mothers in their 40s. I'm sure they would say they've got life experience that perhaps makes them a, a better mother. And they'd also say that because they've, they've had their 20s and 30s, they've travelled, for example, they might have more time to, to dedicate to being a mother. Yes, of course. I mean, there's obviously the financial benefit as well, because mm. obviously you have, hopefully, you have more money by the time you're 40. Um, there is that there is that side of it, and there is that side where you've had the life experiences so you don't have any regrets. Mm. You know, I had my first child at 22. So, you know, that that's really young. That's on the other side of it, mm. you know, and I found mm. that very young. All my friends were partying, and I was there with babies. But I think that, you know, in, in your 40s, you, you, yes, you have all of that and have all of that behind you, but you have to think of the child as well, not just about yourself. And I think this is what people fail to think about is, you know, 20, 30 years down the line, hopefully you'll still be there, but are you going to be there? And, you know, that can really affect a child um, as way of thinking. You know, I hear it. I hear I've got friends that have had children very late on in life and I've got friends that are parents who are in their 80s and they're not even married and they're like, well, we must get married because I don't know if dad's going to be here. You know, and that's a really big burden to carry on your shoulders as well when they're trying to get on with their lives. So I think it's it needs consideration as well. And also, again, you know, you hear that a lot of uh, babies are born earlier as well because, you know, you're a bit older, so they bring on, the, you know, there's lots of cesareans. There's lots of different aspects to having a child later on in life. There's good sides and there's bad sides, but I would say... You know, really think about it if you're going to do that. Think about your child and your child's future. OK, Amanda Jenner, thank you very much indeed. And thanks to, thank to you to Olivia Buxton, who we talked to uh, a little bit earlier on. I'll tell you what draws me slightly on this is that I can, I can understand the concerns, mm. um, but then you also get criticism when it's the other way around, don't you? And you end up sort of being grandparents at 39 and things yeah, like that. Do. And then people are very critical of you then. Yeah. So it's like... Well, you can't, you know, unless you've got it bang in the golden zone. <laughs> and when is the golden zone? When is the right time? Well, this is I it. Don't know. And then how are you meant to have a career and all this? I don't know. I just think it's you can't do right for doing wrong. No, really. You're right. Every, Maybe every, it's everybody's different. Down to the individual families, perhaps. Uh, well, we have been in touch with Rachel Burden, and she sent GB News this statement. Yeah, she said, inevitably, the headlines have somewhat distorted the conversation. The selfishness was not about being an old mom, and more about already being a mother of three and still wanting to extend the family further. This is a highly sensitive subject around family and fertility issues, and I'm confident the podcast speaks for itself and gives full context. This is a fair enough comment to make. It is fair enough comment. I just thought, sort of yeah, let people... Do what they want to. If they want to do it at that age, why not? If they can afford to do it. Yeah. And as long as they're happy and the children are happy, what does it matter? Well.
That's what yeah. I'd be inclined to think anyway. Well, yeah, I, I'm on that line as well, to yeah, be perfectly we'll honest. Yeah, think. <laughs> Including in our colour scheme today. Now, still to come, who wanted to see Aidan earlier? Can you remember? Oh, I can't remember. Uh, we had somebody on gbnews.com, you'll say... I say moaning. Christine Stock. Christine. Making a very valid point, Christine, that she hadn't seen the sport in the last hour. Well, it's coming up mm. in just a couple of minutes, Christine, so do not move. The latest GB News travel. Good morning, I'm Russell Holding on the M6 in Cumbria. The outside lane is closed each way at Junction 39 at Shap after an accident. The northbound entry slip road is also closed. On the M6 on Merseyside, there's a lane closed southbound after an accident between Junctions 23 and 22 from Haydock to Newton the Willows with queues towards there. From Junction 25 in the West Midlands, New Street and Tower Street in Dudley are closed for an investigation. On the M1 in Leicestershire, the inside lane's closed northbound after an accident. Not far before Junction 21 for the M69 near Leicester. The queues are halfway back to Junction 20 at Lutterworth. In Powys, the A4067 remains closed each way at Ustrid Gunlice because of a landslip. In Dorset, the A350 is partly blocked southbound by an accident on Sturt Street. It's not in the Holds Bay roundabout in Paul. That's the latest. You can stay up to date throughout the day by visiting our website, gbnews.com. I'm Michelle Jubery, and I'm not here to tell you what to think. I'd much rather hear what you have to say. So, send in your opinions to gbviews at gbnews.com, keep them clean, and you never know, I might read them out. With my panel here on Jubes & Co, we debate, we get stuck into the issues of the day on a show where all views are welcome, especially yours. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I think the most exciting bit for me is talking to people. People who I think are ignored often by the major news channels, we're going to give news they want to hear. There's a voice there that needs to be heard. I think there's a chance here for a diversity of opinion to be expressed, which you don't find elsewhere. It's really exciting. We don't hold back. We're free to say how decisions that are taken here affect us all around the country. Only on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. I'm Andrew Doyle. Join me at 7 o'clock every Sunday night for Free Speech Nation, the show where I tackle the week's biggest stories in politics and current affairs with the help of my two comedian panellists and a variety of special guests. Free Speech Nation, Sunday nights from 7 on GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Your weekend starts here with Friday Night Live with me, Mark Dolan, 8 till 9 on GB News. Big stories, big guests and big laughs as we get you ready for a cracking weekend. That's Friday Night Live with Mark Dolan. Fridays 8 till 9 on GB News. Bring your own drinks. The admission's free. Every Sunday from 11, join Michael Portillo. There will be topical discussion, looking at the week before and the week to come. So kick back and relax at 11am on Sundays on GB News with me, Michael Portillo. GB News, the people's channel, Britain's news channel. Aidan McGee's got the sport for you, so don't panic. Good morning. Good morning. How are you doing? Yeah, all right. Nice though. I, I'm, I'm concerned about what we've heard from Harry Kane. Well, it's good news, to be fair. I mean, at least he said the, he's announced the virus spokesperson last night that the children are, uh, are fine. But, I mean, they look at their ages, seven, five and three. You can imagine how distressed he would have been when he landed in London on Monday in readiness for the Arsenal game. Playing, he was playing for Bayern Munich in the Champions League there, the quarter-final the day after. But imagine landing Ellie on that runway and getting the call to say that your children have been involved in a, in a crash. It was, mm. must have been absolutely horrific. Now, and little children as well. Oh, yeah, they are. I mean, they're, they're, um, they're Vivienne, Ivy and Louis, as I say, seven, five and three. There was a, th a three-car oh. collision uh, involving, involving a couple of local uh, drivers. It was a Mercedes, a Renault and a Land Rover. The Mercedes uh, Vito was the one carrying uh, Harry Kane's children. But, as I say, uh, he announced yesterday, the virus spokesman, that they are fine. They did go to hospital and they needed treatment, but nonetheless, he still managed to go to the Arsenal game on uh, Tuesday and score goals, which is a mark of his uh, professionalism, I would say. Mm. Mm. Yeah, well, yes. yeah, yeah. Oh, bless him, the whole family. Yeah. yeah. Such a likeable guy and a very, very good player. Yeah. He is, and a, and a great player as well. Um, should we talk about the Europa League and my favourite team, Bayer Leverkusen? Well, they're so unsuccessful <laughs> locally, you know that. 
They sound successful. They're known as, they're, and they never win anything. They're known as Bayern Neverkusen. Oh. So, uh, but well, they're, they did well last night. They did brilliantly last night, and they're them. unbeaten since last May. Uh, and they're top of the Bundesliga. Their manager looks like he could. Well, he said he's not going to, but he still could turn up as, as Klopp's replacement at Liverpool last uh, next season, rather. But they beat West Ham 2-0 at home. It was a late goal, the late, the late second, uh, or two late goals, actually, which probably put pays to West Ham's interest in the competition, I would say, unless they can turn it round at the London Stadium next week. And Liverpool was the real upset of the night. They got beaten 3-0 at home to Atalanta. Atalanta, another side, no pedigree in Europe, really, not discernibly over the last couple of decades. And they go there and win 3-0, devastating uh, a display of a counter-attacking uh, football. Jurgen Klopp leaves. Trent Alexander-Arnold, Diaz, Sabosky, uh, Sabozlai, sorry, uh, Hotter, Robinson, uh, Robertson, and Salah on the bench. If you leave your best players on the bench, you are going to slip up at some point. They've got a huge, huge uh, schedule coming up, and it's going to be going to be tough. Being a bit cocky, isn't it? Basically. I would, I would, well, it is. I mean, maybe you look to their side and they're sixth in the league and thought they're not going to trouble us. I mean, look, they, they, it's not impossible. They could go and do the job in Italy next week. But when you consider they've got to go to Atalanta, they've got to go away to Fulham, away to Everton, away to West Ham, that's a tough schedule when you're trying to win the league. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, can we talk about the Masters? Yeah, just quick. We haven't, we haven't got long, but Bryson DeChambeau is leading. Now, the issue there is that he was... Or the talking point there is that he's a live golfer and yeah. that's the breakaway. And it was suggested that... They might be a little bit undercooked because they're not played as much. But he's leading at the moment. Rory McIlroy has uh, hit, hit, hit 71. Now, the issue with McIlroy is it, it's 10 years now since he's won a major. Is it really? And so, and so he had a chat with Jack Nicholas, Nick, Nickel, uh, Jack, I was going to say Jack Nicholson, but uh, no, Jack Nicholas the other week, <laughs> trying to get that, those demons out of his head to enable him to try and, um, try and compete. But it's, he's, not, he's made a bit of a mixed start. But we'll, we'll know more over the weekend how he's going to do. And you will be here to bring oh, us all the details. Oh, without Never miss you a trick. Get rid of me Nobody needs no, to. No, we don't want to be. I went, I went and had an omelette. What, just now? Yeah. Where from? Just some cafe up the road. Oh. They know me in there. Yeah. What do they? Well, that's what you do when you get an hour off. Yeah, is it? So, thanks for bringing one back here. <laughs> what a it's not like we wanted anything, it's fine. No, no, I'm, sure, I'm sure I asked you, didn't I? No, you forgot. <laughs> get out. I look after the talent. We'll see you in the morning. Indeed. All right, Aidan, thanks very much indeed. Coming up, we're going to take you through the papers with Nigel and Claire. Don't go anywhere. GB News is the home of free speech. We were created to champion it, and we deliver it day in, day out. Free speech allows us all to explore and debate openly the issues most important to us, our families, and of course, the British people. Having challenging conversations to enlighten each other, which is why we hear all sides of the argument. We are the people's channel. We will always stand by the freedom to express yourself. On TV, radio, and online. This is GB News, Britain's news channel. Tubes & Co. Weekdays from 6pm. You think this country needs new gas power stations? Apparently, this will all be about trying to get some form of energy security. Rishi Sunak has upset people today with this suggestion, people saying that actually this would do more damage to climate change uh, than it would do good. Where are you on it, Richard? Uh, I'll tell you exactly where. We need a lot more gas power stations and nuclear power stations because quite often the wind doesn't blow and the sun doesn't shine. Last week, we imported 16% of all our electricity because we haven't got enough capacity in the UK and we're now totally over-reliant on renewables. Um, the part of the problem is the lack of storage capacity, which mm. the government has finally got round to addressing. I think this, as backup, is actually quite a sensible idea. But they are not doing anything, as far as I can tell. At the moment, it will be retrofitted to have storage capability, which seems to be utterly bonkers. I mean, anyone who's got solar panels, um, you know, you know very well you're storing up energy. So it's about storage as much as production. And they could have gone, you know, 20 years ago, we could have had nuclear power. You know, we, we could have done more. We haven't looked far enough ahead in the future and we are in grave danger of making the same mistake. I mean, the other side of this is what is the difference going to be? Blackouts are, you know, they're irritating and... Irritating? It'd be disastrous well, if you destroy our now. economy. Well, they would be now, but, you know, um, some of us remember three-day weeks and things like that. And, in fact, you know, I grew up thinking that everybody had, you know, at least a couple of days a week when they had 
to eat off a primus stove and things. This is again, I don't want to harp on, but this is one of the problems in the politics in our country, isn't it? So many politicians, they just think in election cycles, Absolutely. they just think, what can I do and yeah. say to get my own backside re-elected uh, at the next general election? They're not always looking ahead. Uh, actually, politics aside, what is genuinely the best thing for this country? I'm Patrick Christie's. Every weeknight from nine, I bring you two hours of unmissable, explosive debate and headline-grabbing interviews. What impact has that had? We got death threats and the bomb threats on. Our job is to do what's in the best interest of our country. You made well, my I'm argument so... for no, me. My guests and I tackle the issues that really matter with a sharp take on every story. I'm hearing it up and down the country. That was a beginning, not an end. Patrick Christie's tonight from 9 p.m. only on GB News, Britain's news channel. Welcome right. back. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go through the papers this morning with Nigel Nelson and his good lady wife, Claire Pearsall. He's got the sense not to go by Nelson on here. <laughs> um, good to see you both this morning. Um, let's talk hay fever, should we? Uh, Nigel, you've picked this one. Yeah, well, well, because I'm a sufferer. Um, As am I, Nigel. Well, there you go. We're, we are uh, two of ten million around the country who, who suffer from hay fever. and we're All the best get... people do, I think. Most people, do you think? I think all the best people do. Oh, the best people, yes. I was absolutely right. Yes, yeah. yes, yeah. yes. Yeah, ten million of the best people. <laughs> um, however, what we're going we're to get hit with is the uh, highly anagenic uh, birch pollen and grass. Grass, as always. I mean, grass is, is arriving every year. Is it a pollen bomb that they sometimes <laughs> talk about? A bomb. Well, we've we, we a problem with um, climate change, so we've got an awful lot of... Lot of uh, Everyone's <laughs> looking at me very cynically yes. when I mention the word climate change. Oh. Um, mm. So it's all coming in from abroad, warmer climates, <laughs> uh, that, uh, and so we, we end up being hit with an awful lot more uh, than just the domestic stuff. Mm. Mm. And you can tell, and it's come early this year as well, I think. Yeah. I'm already suffering. Yeah. Well, I'm getting a twitchy nose, so I know, it's, I, know it's, yeah, I, know it's, I know it's coming. Oh, um. dear. It makes me nervous. Yeah, my eyes go really bloodshot. And they start streaming. They and start itching and things like that. Oh, it's just the worst. Do you, do you not suffer? I, I get it a little bit. Yeah, now, a little bit. But not much. Yeah, not huge. I can take some antihistamine and I'm fine. I don't have to make a song and dance about it and <laughs> sneeze. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I see. Um, I might get the injection this year. Oh, yeah. I'm look into it. Yeah, it'll be worth it, I think. Oh, there you go. Um, <laughs> can we talk spaghetti bolognese? Yeah. Why did I say bolognese? I don't know. Bolognese. <laughs> bolognese. It's because you're, you know, continental. Oh, mm. I, don't, I don't think so. Anyway, what's the star saying about this? We're ruining it. Apparently, <laughs> the Italians believe that uh, we have ruined spaghetti bolognese because we put too many things in it. Oh. So the old style uh, ragu recipe didn't have very many ingredients and the Brits are known to uh, put in things uh, along with the beef they put in uh, pancetta, carrots, celery, um, yeah. onion, garlic cloves. You don't put onion in it? Oh, I, I do. Oh, yeah. So what are you I... meant to put in it, Claire? It's just a very basic uh, tomato and onion and beef. That's a very, very basic ragu no. recipe. And we throw in it's... the odd mushroom and carrot and things. No. We just chuck in whatever we like. And I kind of think that's nice. I think that we need to make these dishes uh, our own. Um, yeah. I think the Italians are getting a little bit upset, but if we like it... Um... It's their dish. <laughs> well, yeah. Yes, but we're just making it something slightly different. And I think that... But that, isn't that cooking, though? Don't you have a recipe and then you evolve it and everybody makes it slightly different and adds slightly different things in, a bit of oh. chocolate or whatever it is? If you do that into some bolognese, by the way, very nice. Really? Chocolate. Dark chocolate. Oh, God. Oh, oh we Claire, go. we're not really on <laughs> that one. Here we go. Mind you, experts also say we need to ditch fried bread from full English breakfasts. Yeah, I mean, this is what? just... I mean, this is just ruining things. I think we all know that fried bread is never going to be the most nutritious food you, you have ever had. Mm. But I think in moderation, why not? Why not? Eggy goes, bread. Egg, oh, eggy bread. Oh, eggy that's a good bread. Place. Oh, I've done oh. that for ages. Well, we always use that's what you're having for your breakfast. Exactly. That's what I have for breakfast. See, now that's oh, yeah. it. We, it always used, we always used to have that at Cub Scouts and we went, um, oh. when we went camping with the Cubs. It was oh. that eggy bread. Oh, that's cute. Oh. This is a properly good comfort food as well. Yeah, it's lovely. Yeah, you need that as part of a full English. Uh, and olive oil 
has apparently got too pricey for us Brits as well, Claire. It has risen by about 50%, so it depends where you shop. It's, but it's around £14 a bottle now for yeah. olive oil. And I appreciate this sounds a bit like a middle-class issue here. But it is a lot expensive. of people like olive oil. Yeah, and you can—I mean, the, you can buy it slightly cheaper in the more budget supermarkets. But even so, that's still around about eleven pounds. Oh, well, we always used to buy olive oil. Increase. Always got olive oil. Now I've gone to vegetable oil or yeah, whatever, other some flour or Does whatever. Does it affect the taste? Well, it's not as nice. Yeah, but it does the job. But for cooking, you may as well. Yeah, yeah mm -hmm. use vegetable oil. Um, I hate to go to another star. Story. It's like the Daily Star review this, <laughs> Nigel, but I'm, I'm afraid sometimes they just come up with some of the nicer <laughs> stories. 47% um, of Brits, um, which means 53%, if I turn it around, 53% of Brits think the government is prepared for an alien invasion. And 18% think it'll happen. Um, <laughs> as, this, as you said, it was the Daily Star that did a poll, but this is actually research coming from the uh, British UFO Research Association, a chap called Philip Mantle. Um, we've been talking about Britain's defence and uh, defending against... Well, we've Russian... got this laser now. We've built this laser, haven't we? That's right, yes. I mean, Dragonfly, was it? Doubtfire, <laughs> is it? <laughs> <laughs> Dragonfly. Dragonfire. Dragonfire. But the, the argument is we're still not prepared if the aliens actually arrive. Well, so we've got our not. trident missiles um, on on our submarines ready to deal with the Russians or the Chinese, we're not so good when it comes down to UFOs. Um, the only good news here is that the uh, Philip Mantle says that if the aliens have travelled so many light years to get here, uh, they're hardly going to want to beat us up, they're going to come here in peace. I'm not sure I believe that. I would think they would travel up light years to come and beat us up, personally. But they're... No, you no. miserable devil. Can, you, can you, imagine, <laughs> you imagine the outrage on social media? What, on, on Vulcan? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> they've gone, oh, all they've done is attack when they get there. Exactly, coming down our high street, dressed like that. You know, we, I mean, the Brits, I think, would take it in uh, bad spirits that somebody had come to invade us. I'm, I think that the aliens would get short shrift off the good people of the United Kingdom and they'd soon retreat. Yeah. Hmm. Um, Claire, should we take a look at mm. um, WhatsApp? And there's fears for children's safety as WhatsApp has cut its minimum age to 13. Yeah, so this is Meta who um, own uh, WhatsApp and they have cut the minimum age to 13 from 16, which actually came as a bit of a surprise to me I because I it. thought it was always 13 yeah. along with many other platforms. And that, and that is their argument. Meta believe that they're, all they're doing is bringing their product into line with the regulations that are already there for um, other products. So it, it's one of these issues where people are either going to be in favour of banning all kinds of smartphones and social media and any kind of contact for, for young people. Like the, and, like the Prime Minister is. Like the Prime Minister and, and, I, and then people like me who believe that the kids are growing up with technology. Technology is going to be part and parcel of their future. They need to be able to learn to use it responsibly. So I think that we don't need the government to come in with legislation to ban it. We don't need the government to legislate for Meta to ramp the age back up to 16 because kids will always find a workaround. We as ad adults and especially as parents need to monitor what our kids do online and what they have in their hand. I think personal responsibility mm -hmm. is a huge issue here. We don't need the government to legislate for something because that's like taking a sledgehammer to crack a walnut. Oh, well, there you go. Nigel? There you go. Oh. <laughs> Very briefly. No, no, I agree with that because I just oh. think. Oh, well, there you go. Harmony. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll stop there. <laughs> you've, got, just you've got them going on the bolognese. Danny says bolognese should be just beef, tomato, onion, basil, salt, and pepper, and garlic. Whereas John says ragu is pork and beef mince, grated carrot and celery, chopped tomato and puree, but never garlic. <laughs> yeah. Um, and uh, Mark Foster in Killington says, nothing wrong with having your own regional ragu. And by the way, fried bread is healthy if fried in lard or dripping. <laughs> so there you go. There you go. That doesn't <laughs> make you Divide a bit peckish this morning. Oh, it does. There you go. All right. Thank you, you too. Let's have a look at the weather. Here's Alex. Looks like things are heating up. Box spoilers. Sponsors of weather on GB News.
Morning. Here's your latest GB News weather update brought to you by the Met Office. A bit of a north-south split as we go through today and into the weekend. Some dry, fine weather towards the south, wetter further north. This morning, there are heavy outbreaks of rain pushing across parts of Northern Ireland into Northern England and across the bulk of Scotland, though northeastern parts clinging on to some sunshine into the afternoon. Do watch out for some strong gusty winds in the northwest. Across the bulk of England and Wales, lots of fine and at times sunny weather into this afternoon and temperatures rising to highs of around 20, 21, possibly even 22 Celsius towards the southeast. Everywhere, temperatures will be well above average for the time of year. Sticking with the north-south split as we go through the end of the day and into tomorrow, further rain across northern parts, particularly across the borders area, likely to see some heavy bursts for a time and showers feeding in from the northwest. Staying drier towards the south and there will be some clear skies, but quite a bit of cloud and we have mild air across us, so temperatures not dropping a huge amount for most places. Through Saturday itself then, a bit of cloud bringing some drizzly rain across northern and western parts of England and Wales perhaps. Towards the southeast though, lots of fine and at times sunny weather again. The more unsettled picture will be once more across parts of Scotland and Northern Ireland. Here some hefty showery rain pushing its way through and temperatures for many will be down a touch compared to today. As we go into Sunday and we're going to see further showers which could be heavy at times across northern areas, drier towards the south but temperatures dropping compared to recent. A brighter outlook with Bob Solar, sponsors of weather on GB News. The latest GB News travel. Good morning, I'm Russell Holding. On the M6 in Cumbria, there's a lane closed each way at Junction 39 at Shap after an accident, and the northbound entry slip roads closed there too. On the M6 on Merseyside, there's a lane closed southbound after an accident between junctions 23 and 22 from Haydock to Newton Willows, with queues from junction 25. In Staffordshire, the A444 is blocked when they're doing emergency pothole repairs. Uh, Stappen Hill causing delays. In the West Midlands, New Street and Tower Street in Dudley are closed for an investigation. On the M25, 25 in Essex, two out of four lanes closed anti-clockwise where a car's broken down between junctions 27 and 26 from the M11 to Waltham Abbey. It's slowed towards and past there. And on the M27 in Hampshire, two lanes are closed eastbound after an accident between junctions 5 and 7 in Southampton causing delays. It's the latest. You can stay up to date throughout the day by visiting our website gbnews.com. Variety Cruises have been sailing since 1942, and thanks to them, you could set sail in 2025. You have the chance to win a seven-night small boat cruise for two worth £10,000. With your flights, meals, drinks and excursions included, you can choose from any one of their 2025 Greek adventures and find your home at sea. You'll also win an incredible £10,000 in tax-free cash that you can use to make this summer spectacular. We'll also treat you to these luxury travel gifts. For another chance to win a prize worth over £20,000, text PRIZE to 63232. Text cost £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB04, PO Box 8690, Derby DE19T. UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5pm on the 26th of April. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash win. Please check the closing time if listening or watching on demand. Good luck. Good afternoon, Britain. Good afternoon, Britain. Weekdays from midday, we bring you the most compelling stories from across the United Kingdom. And why it matters to you. From your doorstep to our inbox. That's right, we want to hear from you. Good afternoon, Britain. Only on GB News, the People's Channel, Britain's news channel. In the GB Newsroom, we bring you the news as it happens. With our team of dedicated journalists across the UK, GB News brings you accurate reporting of the day's topical agenda. When the news breaks, wherever and whenever it's happening, we'll be there. This is GB News. The People's Channel, Britain's news channel. Your weekend starts here with Friday Night Live with me, Mark Dolan, 8 till 9 on GB News. Big stories, big guests and big laughs as we get you ready for a cracking weekend. That's Friday Night Live with Mark Dolan. Fridays 8 till 9 on GB News. Bring your own drinks. The admission's free. Good morning to you. Nine o'clock, Friday the 12th of February. Today... No, April. April. Oh, it's April, isn't it? Yeah. 
Oh, my <laughs> Lord. <laughs> I don't know how we got to that. I don't know how we got there. Uh, Sir Keir Starmer pledges to boost military spending to 2.5%, as he says the country's nuclear deterrent is safe in his hands. Yes, Keir Starmer is determined to make the Labour Party the party of defence. But does he have the cash to put his money where his mouth is? Find out more with me very soon. Controversial NFL star O.J. Simpson, who was cleared of murdering his ex-wife and her friend in a criminal trial, dies at the age of 76 following a battle with cancer. People in Portland are furious over what they deem to be a luxury-free bus service to ferry asylum seekers around. Men are up in arms over a women's social media page that calls out exes on their bad behaviour. We're asking, should people really name and shame their old flames? Some warm sunshine across southern parts as we head into the weekend, but a wetter story further north. I'll have more in the full forecast shortly. Morning to you. I'm Stephen Dixon. And I'm Ellie Costello, and this is Breakfast on GB News. I mean, when you work shifts like this, you do sometimes forget what day it is, mm. or even what time of the day it is, mm. to get the month wrong. Mm. By a lot. February. February. Where'd you get that from? I don't know. Mm. I don't know. This year is going very quickly. <laughs> well, yes. That's I'm just true. wishing to be back to being 49, you see, in February. Mid April. Well, yes, maybe that's what it is. Maybe. Wanting to be in a different decade. I do apologise if that confused you this morning. Oh, yes. We are in April. You'll be glad to know. Uh, now, Rachel Burden is a journalist at the BBC. She's been talking about becoming a mother to her fourth child at age 41. She's described it as selfish. It's got you all going this morning. Uh, Liz says, I think it's selfish to have a baby at 20 without a stable family. My son was born when I was 40. It was the first time I was with a man I wanted to spend the rest of my life with. Hmm. It's hmm. a fair point. Yes. Uh, Susie says, I was not able to have a baby before I was 42 as I had unexplained infertility. I now have a beautiful 20-year-old and I'm 62 now. For me, it is a true blessing from God and the best thing that ever happened to me. I don't feel selfish at all. I think we're too easy to criticise yep. people. If you're able to have, a, you know, a, a particularly healthy child at that age, then if you feel like you're up for it, why not? I mean, it would worry me being um, an older parent, because mm. I'm knackered now, basically. I wouldn't want to... You basically wanna... are a parent to Rex. Oh, it's not the same with animals. It's not the same. Oh, but you have to be very hands-on. Well, you do, but it's not the same not as a mm. child. And my, plus, my niece and nephew are in their 20s now. Are they? So, and they're the nearest thing I have to children. Apart, well, I've got another nephew now who's... Four, no. um, so I'm like getting the chance to do that again a little bit. That's but nice. I wouldn't want to have kids now. I'm too, I do feel like I'm too old, but I'm 50, not 40. Well, on the other side of things, uh, Linda says I was adopted. My parents were 41 and 43. They adopted me after they lost a child. They were wonderful parents. Absolutely no regrets. All a child needs is to feel loved. Well, that I would agree with. Yeah. That's the, that's the bottom line. That's what that what that's what means everything. I've got to point out as well. Loads of you have been in touch this morning, listening on GB News Radio, um, including Raymond Allen, who's the latest one to pop up. Hi, Raymond. Um, it says you know you can't hear things very well on the radio. Apparently, the sound le the sound levels are a bit low. Um, so I don't know why that is, but we are looking into it for you. Some be yeah. some technical thing somewhere. Um, probably not even in this building, probably in a different somewhere else where it all gets piped through. Uh, but we are going to look at that for you, so uh, don't panic if you're listening on the radio this morning. Now, you might see Stephen looking over at his laptop, looking at our new forum. It's gbnews.com slash your say. It's our new way of getting in touch with you, your new way of getting in touch with us. Yes. No longer on email. And the nice thing is about it is that you can talk to each other as well as talking to us. So it's like a yeah. nice little family conversation. Um, anyway, if you want to know how it all works, here's Bev. We are proud to be GB News, the people's channel. And as you know, we always love to hear your views. Now, there's a new way of getting in touch with us at gbnews.com forward slash your say. By commenting, you can be part of a live conversation and join our GB News community. You can even talk to me, Bev Turner, or any of the members of the GB News family. Simply go to gbnews.com forward slash your say. See, Bev says forward slash there. She Sorry, does, Bev. as do I. You're wrong. 
I think wrong. most people say forward slash. No, slash. It's you who's very modern. It's saying slash. Saying need a forward. Or backslash. And you very rarely use a backslash. Okay. So there you go. Just pointing that out. Mm. Now, to our top story today, and the Labour leader, Sir Keir Starmer, says that the UK's nuclear deterrent is the bedrock of his plan to keep Britain safe. Well, of course, uh, that's in real stark contrast to what Jeremy Corbyn was pushing. He was the champion of nuclear disarmament. Well, meanwhile, Sir Keir Starmer said he would like to boost the defence budget 2.5% of GDP. Earlier, we spoke to the Shadow Defence Minister, Luke Pollard. The world is a more contested and difficult place than it has been for a very long time. And that's why we need to make sure that the armed forces have the resources they need to keep the UK and our allies safe. That's why a commitment to the continual at sea deterrent, those nuclear submarines always at sea, able to defend the UK and our allies, is so important. But it's also why we're setting out that defence spending should be directed at UK companies first before we look at buying from international companies. Well, we're joined now by our political correspondent, Olivia Utley, who joins us live now from Westminster. Good to see you, Olivia. And we've come a long way in five years, haven't we? We really, really have. When Jeremy Corbyn was leader of the Labour Party, he was uh, impassionate in an impassioned way. He was trying to trying to dismantle Trident. That's what he said he wanted to do if he became prime minister. He wanted total nuclear disarmament. Well, we now have a Labour leader in Keir Starmer who is not only pro-nuclear, but he is also trying to make the Labour Party the party of defence. He says that he will raise defence spending to 2.5%, something that the Conservatives Conservatives have consistently failed to do. At the moment, it is at 2.3%. Now, obviously, that will appeal uh, to, to sort of centre voters. There are plenty of traditional Conservative voters who care passionately about defence. In fact, Ben Wallace, who was uh, the previous Defence Secretary, kept saying that he wanted to see defence raising spend, uh, defence spending raised to 3%, and he was very, very popular in the Conservative Party as a result. So we could see quite a few voters shift over from Conservatives to Labour from this policy alone. That said, it's not all plain sailing for Keir Starmer. For a start, we haven't yet heard exactly how the Labour Party is planning to cost this. Uh, there is no breakdown so far of what will have to be cut or how taxes will have to increase in order to pay for this rise in defence spending. And, of course, there are plenty of Labour voters, particularly those of the sort of Corbyn mindset who tend to be Labour members, who are stridently opposed to uh, nuclear weapons and could end up voting elsewhere as a result. They could end up going to the Green Party, for example. So it's sort of wins and losses for Keir Starmer here. And it'll be really interesting to see in the coming days and weeks how this policy develops and where the money is going to come from. OK, Olivia, thanks very much indeed. And her lovely background isn't so lovely anymore. No, it's gone a bit more less smoggy. <laughs> it's a bit more like London now, grey. Yes. Now, it's been just over six months since the government's controversial barge, the Bibby Stockholm, first opened its doors to asylum seekers. Of course, it went on very long, originally. Well, no. Uh, well, since then, tensions amongst locals have been running high. One of the main sources of frustration amongst Portlanders is a luxury-free bus service that ferries asylum seekers around whilst locals are left out in the cold. Well, our South West of England reporter Jeff Moody has been back to Portland to find a community just as angry and just as divided as ever. When the bus comes in Portland, not everyone can get on it. If they travel on the bus with the local community, there could be some sort of integration because a lot of people are confused of why they're here and maybe a little chat on the bus because that's where people do talk. Because I meet people on the bus every day and you end up chatting. Wouldn't this be a great way to integrate? But no, they're separated. And how can the local community move forward if they're always kept in isolation from us? For some, there are echoes of segregation, and it's leading to resentment. Resentment at the special buses, resentment at the health care the Bibby residents receive, resentment at the wet weather gear for hiking that Dorset Council provides. Six months on from the arrival of the first residents on the Bibby Stockholm, the feeling in the local community is just as strong, just as divided and just as passionate as it always has been. 
And while a community that didn't ask for this argues and accuses, the sheer cost of the Bibby Stockholm sticks in their throat. £34.8 million. If you break that down into figures, that works out at capacity at about £4,500 per month per head. And I mean, if you do a little bit of investigation, you can rent a really plush house in Sandbanks for that money or an apartment in Chelsea each. Or, you know, you may as well just send them on um, a Caribbean cruise for a month, all inclusive, because that's what £4,500 a month will get you for your money. They were sold the idea the barge was cheaper on the taxpayer's pocket than asylum hotels. But in an investigation by the National Audit Office into the Home Office's asylum policy, it was revealed not only is this more expensive than hotels, at the time of commissioning the barge, the Home Office had not even estimated costs. They were flying blind. I'm shocked, really. I mean, the Home Office blatantly lied. Um, they told us that the Bibby Stock Home was to offer value for the taxpayer for housing asylum seekers. And we now know from the National Audit Office document that was released at the end of March that it's not just a little bit more expensive, it's exorbitantly more expensive. It, I mean, it, it's obscene, the cost, the money that is being thrown at this barge. In a statement, the Home Office told GB News, we have always been clear that the use of asylum hotels is unacceptable and that's why we acted swiftly to reduce the impact on local communities by moving asylum seekers onto barges and former military sites. While the National Audit Office's figures include set-up costs, it is currently better value for money for the taxpayer to continue with these sites than to use hotels. But the taxpayers in Portland don't feel they're getting value. And they don't feel valued either. And it's starting to be a problem. Jeff Moody, GB News. Can I just say this morning, um, to all of you listening and watching and getting in touch on gbnews.com slash your say, you're all wrong. You're oh. all wrong, because you're all agreeing with Ellie on yeah. forward slash. Yeah, I told you. They are. Oh, They're all agreeing They do with you. generally agree Chris, with me. Chris Barrett, forward slash, forward slash, forward slash. Yeah. Uh, and uh, Paul Anthony, I used to be a computer programmer, and it was forward slash and backslash because it's unambiguous. Yeah, exactly. No, no, no hmm. someone did agree with me. Um, Jake think, Williams agreed with me. I think I am generally right oh, on things. Kevin Hardy says Stephen Dixon that. for PM. Thank you. Uh, but Don't no, encourage him. No, thank you. So, so they are all, all agreeing with you, Ellie. Yes, well, nothing new there. So, frankly, you're all mad. Oh, yes, forward slash and backslash. There you go. So I'll continue the way I was saying it, which is gbnews.com forward slash your say. Yeah, all right, I give up. Um, let's find out what's coming up in Britain's newsroom this morning. Uh, Pip and Ben are here. Good morning. Good morning to you. Good morning, you two. What's coming up in today's show? Well, we're hoping to hear from Labour leader Sir Keir Starmer mm. about nuclear deterrence, Labour's commitment to it. Uh, not something you would have heard from Jeremy Corbyn, no. is it? No, no, no. Uh, but also, lots of people looking ahead to the Grand National tomorrow. Mm. Former, uh, well, Grand National winner, bit of a legend, Barry Geraghty is joining us to talk oh. about it. Um, but I also want to reflect the other side of it, because every year there are fatalities, there are horses dying. Are you pro or against? I'm uncomfortable with it. Really? I think, yeah, I think it's famous, yeah, but I also think it's infamous. But, but they, they've for the diluted wrong the race so much in recent years. They've reduced the Why size they of fences. Jumps? They're reducing Why do the they need force. jumps? Because they're national hunt horses. Why can't they do it flat? If, if, there is if you end These a race, were bred to jump. if you end a race at the very end of it and you go, oh, thank goodness, no horses died. I think that's a really disappointing state of affairs. Well, you speak to anyone who works in national hunt racing, jump racing. None of them will want the horses to die. And, but they do. And they do die, but it's they part do of die. the sport. They do die. Three or four died every year. Anyway, it's something that's got us yeah. to yeah. be feisty. And we will talk to Barry Garrity about it as well. And also, Harry and Meghan, uh, details of their new Netflix uh, shows are coming out. Harry's oh. doing one on Polo. Oh. And uh, Meghan is doing a cookery show uh, based on entertaining friends and gardening. So She really likes her cooking and baking these days, doesn't she? They've got to come up with something, though, because they've got such a huge deal with Netflix yeah. to, to churn out more. Well, at least yeah. it's not the royal family. No, that's true. Mind you, I can't, I'm not going to tune into a polo documentary. <laughs> Cooking and baking worse. I might be interested in, though. I mean, I, the, su the sugar-free ones are all right. I think it's going to be in the format of... Have you seen Drive to Survive, the um, <laughs> no. Formula One? Oh, the F1 stuff, yeah. Yeah, it's kind of like behind the scenes, bigging up the, the sport, so it's going to be in that sort of well, vibe. In sport. the polo world. Yeah. But polo so, is played in many countries all over the world, oh, yeah. so... And it'll be an audience somewhere. Well, it's what people up and down the country and... 
you know, popping, in out, popping out of their houses after tea and going for a spot of polo. Oh, it's all about being out of touch. Uh, lovely you two. We'll see you a little bit later on. Ben and Pip, thank you very much. Thank you. Time now yes. for our biggest giveaway of the year so far. You could win £10,000 in cash, luxury travel items and a Greek cruise for next year, so you've got plenty of time to plan, worth £10,000. Thousand pounds. Do the sums. Well, it's a prize package worth over twenty thousand pounds, oh. and it could all be yours. Here's how you can win. Variety Cruises have been sailing since 1942, and thanks to them, you could set sail in 2025. You have the chance to win a seven-night small boat cruise for two worth £10,000. With your flights, meals, drinks and excursions included, you can choose from any one of their 2025 Greek adventures and find your home at sea. You'll also win an incredible £10,000 in tax-free cash that you can use to make this summer spectacular. We'll also treat you to these luxury travel gifts. For another chance to win a prize worth over £20,000, text WIN to 63232. Text costs £2 plus one standard network rate message. Or post your name and number to GB04, PO Box 8690, Derby DE1 9 UK only. Entrance must be 18 or over. Lines close at 5pm on the 26th of April. Full terms and privacy notice at gbnews.com forward slash WIN. Please check the closing time if listening or watching on demand. Good luck. I'm Christopher Hope. And I'm Glory DiPiero, bringing you PMQ's live here on GB News. Whenever Parliament is in session on a Wednesday at midday, we'll bring you live coverage of Prime Minister's questions. We'll be asking our viewers and listeners to submit the questions that they would like to put to the Prime Minister, and we'll put that to our panel of top politicians in our Westminster studio. That's PMQ's live here on GB News, Britain's election channel. Farage, Monday to Thursday from 7pm. Good evening. Well, I thought it was an absolutely knockout front page of the sun that went online last night and was on display all over the country today. Union joke, and there is. Well, you can just about make out that it's the Union flag, better known perhaps as the Union Jack, but they've decided to add pink and all sorts of colours to it, and that is on sale uh, for fans going to the Olympics in France this year to buy and to wear, which led to a great big panic. What on earth would be on the shirts, shorts and kit of the athletes? Well, a statement did come out mid-morning from the British Olympic Association, which said all Team GB athletes will wear the Union Jack as normal in Paris. However, Team GB kit itself is expected to include different shades of blue or red as in previous years. Well, I'm sorry, I don't really buy that. Now, we sent Adam Cherry out to Wembley today to ask some members of the public how they felt about this. This episode of Companies Fixing Things That Weren't Broken. We're going to be asking the people of London what they think of the changing colours of the Team GB Olympic logo. Take a look at this. The blue, the red and the, the white, it's perfect. I feel like, you know, it shouldn't be that controversial, controversial but, you know, it's iconic. I feel like the, yeah. the, the colours are iconic. Everyone's known London for being, you know, red, white and blue. I feel like it doesn't really represent England like that. Yeah, the, yeah. the colours of the... Like the colours are kind of random. I, I think it's very colourful. Mm. It's very uh, pinkish and uh, quite unicornish kind of thing, yeah. A bit too unicornish for Team GB. A little bit. Disgusting. Well, we're British. And our colours are not pink and what purple and... So, like, you know, some patterns on there. Yeah, it's yeah, all yeah. going crazy. That's not our flag. Yeah. That don't represent me. Are the newspapers getting you down? My wife didn't divorce me that month. <laughs> <laughs> Struggling to separate the wheat from the chaff. I know that it's a bit of a circus at the best of times. <laughs> <laughs> well, don't worry. Headliners has got you covered. We'll take the burden of reading the day's news, and if we get depressed, who cares? It's an occupational hazard, frankly. That's Headliners on GB News from 11pm till midnight, and the following morning, 5 till 6am, on GB News, the comedy channel. <laughs> nah, just kidding. Britain's news channel. Now, the controversial star O.J. Simpson has died at the age of 76 following a battle with cancer. Well, back in 1995, Simpson was acquitted for double murder of his ex-wife and her friend in a sensational case that divided America. 
Two years later, a civil jury found him liable for wrongful death in the double murder. Well, earlier we spoke to US lawyer Carol Kilgore. He remembers where they were when the verdict um, was read, uh, even people that weren't in the US at the time. And it was, as you said, sensational, um, because a few years earlier was the Rodney King um, <clears throat> beating and there were race riots in LA. And it does feel like that was kind of the beginnings of all of what we're experiencing now with a lot of the controversy around race in America. I heard someone make the argument that because the, the Rodney King, the, the, I mean, there was video of this man being attacked by mm. white police officers, and yet they were acquitted. Yes. Um, I, I, I heard some commentary saying, in a way, that the O.J. Simpson acquittal was people trying to balance the books, okay, if you like. That, that's probably an accurate estimation. Although there were other issues, uh, of course, uh, rather than race, around the trial. I mean, there was the whole defense team of uh, um, O.J. Simpson. If you uh, ever watch shows like The Kardashians, mm. you know, you're, you're watching that legacy of um, those very famous lawyers. And it was one of those situations where the actual legal team became as famous as the celebrity um, defendant. Mm. No, that is, is such an interesting take from all of this. I mean, uh, talking about attorneys, Gloria Allred, who's the attorney who represented Nicole Brown Simpson's family uh, during that murder trial, uh, says that this whole case uh, served as a reminder that the justice system failed women and allowed celebrity men to avoid true justice. How true do you think that is in, in this case? Um, uh, well, I mean, nobody will ever know except O.J., mm. right? And obviously the, the victims would have known, but we can't ask them. But, um, you know, I mean, there's talk around um, the trial that uh, was subsequent to that where he committed an armed robbery to get back some medals that he had uh, lent to a friend. And it does show a, a pattern of behavior which... You know, obviously, it's not enough to to um, to have. They didn't have enough evidence, I would assume, to have uh, convicted him. But uh, you know, and, and then he wrote a book called "If I Did It," um, mm -hmm. where the word <clears throat> "if" was very, very small type on the front of the book. So people assumed from that, oh, well, you know, he's definitely guilty. Um, but in insofar as celebrity men being um, not held accountable for their treatment of women, um, it is. It is true that uh, that happens in America in particular, in, and we've seen lots of instances of that, particularly in the Me Too movement. Um, but as you said, there's issues of race, of uh, celebrity, of uh, male-female kind of, you know, uh, sex <clears throat> wars, and, and mm. uh, it, it was for that reason such a sensational textbook to, uh, case um, that captured everyone's imagination. I mean, it's interesting, though, isn't it? I mean, obviously and understandably, Nicole Brown Simpson and Ron Goldman's families didn't feel like they, they got justice. I mean, even with the, yes. civil, the civil suit, it still isn't justice in the same sure. way. However, his life was destroyed after this, wasn't it? Well, uh, if you ask, if you look at where he was at before, certainly, I mean, the contrast, he was kind of the male version of America's Sweetheart. Mm -hmm. um, and obviously he was in the Naked Gun movie. He was in a lot of commercials um, that people would have remembered growing up. And he was a very, very wholesome uh, figure. So after that, of course, his reputation was going to be damaged. Um, but he didn't help himself by committing the armed robbery. All right, we're nearly out of time. We but are. thankfully, Jane Jones has saved the day. Morning to you, Jane. Yeah. Don't give up, Stephen. You are correct. It's just plain slash. No, which, it doesn't sound which right. Which existed slash. before the digital age, anyway. Thank you, Jane. We are, of course, talking about our new forum. Yes. How you can get in touch with us. GBnews.com forward slash your say. Slash. Which we are going to slash. stick with. Forward slash. 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 You all agree with me on the views, which is well, not, lovely Jane when doesn't. it does happen. Well, Jane about, doesn't. You've plucked one out of the sky yes. there that everybody else says I've got the right idea. Yeah, but I like Jane, she's very good. Uh, Amanda <laughs> Parry says, uh, you brighten up my mornings. Aww. Which is very nice, but in these outfits I'm sure we do. Mm. Um, if you want a, a sneak preview, what are we wearing tomorrow? Green. 
Green is on the agenda for tomorrow, so stay tuned if you want to see that from 6am. But up next, it is Britain's Newsroom with Ben and Pip. But first, here's the weather with Alex Burkill. A brighter outlook with Bob Solar, sponsors of weather on GB News. Morning. Here's your latest GB News weather update brought to you by the Met Office. A bit of a north-south split as we go through today and into the weekend. Some dry, fine weather towards the south, wetter further north. This morning there are heavy outbreaks of rain pushing across parts of Northern Ireland into Northern England and across the bulk of Scotland, though northeastern parts clinging on to some sunshine into the afternoon. Do watch out for some strong gusty winds in the northwest. Across the bulk of England and Wales, lots of fine and at times sunny weather into this afternoon and temperatures is rising to highs of around 20, 21, possibly even 22 Celsius towards the southeast. Everywhere, temperatures will be well above average for the time of year. Sticking with the north-south split as we go through the end of the day and into tomorrow, further rain across northern parts, particularly across the borders area, likely to see some heavy bursts for a time and showers feeding in from the northwest. Staying drier towards the south and there will be some clear skies, but quite a bit of cloud and we have mild air across us, so temperatures not dropping a huge amount for most places. Through Saturday at 